All right, let me know when we're ready, Dave. And we're live. Okay, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our last meeting of 2020. Um, let's, uh, let's get the show on the road. Okay, good evening, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Council of the City of Long Beach held Tuesday, December 15th, 2020 at 7 p.m. Of a roll call, Councilmember Delury. Present. Councilmember Mandel. Present. Councilmember Treston. Present. Vice President McGinnis. Present. President Bendo. Present. Let the record indicate the presence of City Manager Donna Gaydon and Deputy Corporation Counsel Richard Barrios. We'll now have a salute to the flag. All right. Uh, nobody's got a flag behind them tonight, but Rich has got his monster plant there. So, Rich, you want to lead us? Yes, sure. Okay. And over heart, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, thank you. And McNally was uh, apparently hiding on us. He had one behind his head that I couldn't see. So, uh, all right. So why don't we uh, start uh, with the city manager's report. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, the first speaker we have under my report is Mr. Commissioner John Miranda. John, go ahead and unmute. Okay, good evening. Uh, good evening. I guess as everybody is hearing on the news at, at nauseam, we're expecting a possible heavy uh, snowstorm, which may include some sleet mixed in. They are projecting accumulations of possibly 8 to 14 inches with wind gusts up to 50 miles per hour, uh, starting on Wednesday afternoon somewhere between 2 and 5 and lasting till Thursday afternoon about 1 o'clock. On uh, this past Monday afternoon, the city manager held a storm prep meeting with all the staff who will be involved in responding to this event and asked that I give a few reminders to all our residents. Uh, if the snow gets to a significant point, uh, we will be uh, declaring a snow emergency through the city manager office, office. If a snow emergency is declared, everybody should remember that the following streets are emergency snow routes, West Beach Street from Nevada Avenue to Grand Boulevard, West Park Avenue from Nevada Avenue to New York Avenue, West Side of Maryland Avenue from Park Avenue to Beach Street, West Side of J.J. Evans Boulevard from Park Avenue to Pine Street, uh, Shore Road from Long Beach Boulevard to Maple Boulevard, East Pine Street from Neptune Boulevard to Curley Street, and all should be reminded in any snow, snow event, no parking should take place on the canal bridges on Pine Street. Uh, if uh, a snow emergency is declared and any cars are found to be parked on any of those streets, they will be removed, uh, towed away at the owner's expense. Uh, just some reminders for our residents to make uh, some safety tips to make it easier for our people to remove the snow. Uh, we ask the following, please shovel the sidewalks in front of your home. If you live on a corner, please shovel an opening from the sidewalk to the street so strollers and wheelchairs have sidewalk access. Don't shovel or blow your snow back into the street. If you hire a private snow removal company, be sure they do not deposit snow on public property. Clear a space for trash cans so sanitation workers can access them. If you have a storm drain near your home, keep it clear of snow, ice, and debris so melting snow will be able to drain. Clear away snow and ice from fire hydrants so the fire department can access them in the event of an emergency. And please refrain from parking within 15 feet of an intersection to allow plows to make the turn. We don't wanna be taking anybody's mirrors off. Uh, if, in terms of notifications, uh, just as a reminder, Residents can visit www.longbeachny.gov backslash LB ready or call 705-7414 and you can register your cell phone or your home phone number to get uh, snow emergency updates. Um, uh, we, can you repeat that number again, please? Sure. The number to call is 516-705-7414. Uh, or visit the website 
and at www.longbeachny.gov backslash LB ready. Uh, and you can register your cell phone or your regular phone number to get uh, snow emergency updates. Uh, we, we did review the, our snow plan, which has been updated each year. Uh, our staff uh, in beach maintenance and street maintenance are ready and to go and uh, to handle whatever the, this possible storm brings us. Generally speaking, when the snow starts, if we're under the two inch or three inch mark, we will be out there sanding and salting to keep the roads from icing. Uh, once we go over two inches, we bring in the plow, uh, plow crews and, uh, and start plowing the streets. Um, we do the emergency routes first, and then we get to all the side streets. And the last thing that we can get to is the boardwalk. It's important that we keep all the streets clear first for emergency access an event of a fire or an aided case or a police activity. Um, and we expect to have no problems getting through it where we're already in prepared. And that's all I have on that. Are there any questions for Commissioner Miranda? Okay, um, my last speaker for tonight is uh, John McNally. Good evening, everybody. The city manager asked that I give an update on uh, the most recent COVID numbers that we have. So for the seven day period ending yesterday, there were uh, yesterday the 14th, there were 152 confirmed positive test results for COVID-19. Uh, that average is 21.7 a day. And that would put us on par with where we were in the spring during the first spike. So uh, we are we are well into um, a second wave at this stage of the game, and with you know holidays upon holidays upon us, uh, we anticipate those numbers to continue to grow. Uh, we do not have positivity rates for local municipalities for Long Beach or necessarily even Nassau County. What the state has put out though is positivity rates for uh, the Long Island region, Nassau and Suffolk. That stands at 5.67%. Uh, the other key metric that we know the state is using to evaluate whatever restrictions they may put in place is uh, the percent available ICU beds. And currently Long Island stands at 29%, which again is way better than we were in the springtime when the first wave uh, sort of rapidly ascended upon us, but it's also amongst one of the lower percentages in the state. So. Governor essentially said today that he anticipates another shutdown coming if numbers don't start uh, reversing for where the current trend that we're on. So we'd again asked everybody as we continually have to practice safe social distancing, wear masks, avoid indoor gatherings with people that don't live in your home uh, and get tested uh, should you not feel well or believe that you've been exposed to anybody. And that's the extent of my update. Questions? Okay. If there are no questions, um, I just want to wish everyone that is on the call or watching a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And we'll see you in 2021. Okay. Um, and uh, I guess along the lines with the COVID, I guess it's worth noting that uh, city employees tomorrow will have the opportunity to get tested. Uh, the city is... Uh, uh, doing testing or testing is being made available, I should say, to the to city employees um, tomorrow. So uh, hopefully everybody will come out squeaky clean. But uh, all right. Um, I guess, Karen, you had something you wanted to bring up. Yeah. I just had a quick announcement. Thank you, uh, President Bendo, for allowing me this opportunity. Um, my friend Debbie Becker from Long Beach uh, made me aware of, of this program that I would like to share with all of you. The Long Beach Feral Rescue Project was recently created by the Long Beach Animal Shelter slash posh, posh Pets and the City of Long Beach Police Department in response to a growing need in our community. The humane care and rescue of feral stray cats. In the past 15 years, a group of Long Beach citizens and the Long Beach Animal Shelter have spayed, neutered, vaccinated over 1,000 cats and kittens. The Long Beach Animal Shelter is a no-kill shelter. This newly formed feral rescue project now needs the help of you, our Long Beach residents. 
We are seeking volunteers to help with trapping, transporting, feeding, building, shelters, fundraising, and community outreach slash education. It is vital to educate the people of Long Beach about this humane alternative and permanent solution to cat suffering and overpopulation. We welcome hearing from any person, business, and organization that can help. Please reach out to lbeachferalrescue at gmail.com. All this information will be posted on the city's website and Facebook page tomorrow. So together we can find home for kittens born in the wild and provide humane care for cats in need. So thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Uh, John, John, I wanted, yes. I didn't, I said Merry Christmas. I also meant to say um, Happy Hanukkah and Happy Kwanzaa. Yes. So, to everyone. Yes, it's actually Hanukkah right now. So, uh, okay, uh, just a couple other items. I, I think it's pretty much out there now, but uh, in case somebody may not know, we uh, extended an offer to a police commissioner candidate, one of the finalists. Um, they have accepted and uh, will be starting next month, and that is Ron Walsh. Um, he'll be joining us from the, actually from the Nassau County Police Department. He'll be our next police commissioner. Um, what is interesting is he's not even on the payroll yet, and he's, uh, been pretty active. Uh, some of you may have read that the city had an issue with a, with a data breach and a potential data breach and, um, our incoming commissioner kind of sprung into action and uh, brought us in a bunch of resources to help deal with the issue. So uh, I, I'd like to say he's earning his pay, but he's not even getting paid yet and he's already uh, working. So uh, he's been a, a great help during, during this issue. And the other thing is, because uh, I know this is another topic some people are following, uh, at least on social media, it seems to be a buzz. Uh, MLK, the city, the MLK Center, the city, and the um, representatives from the MLK Center, Inc., which is the nonprofit that does programming in there, will be meeting Thursday, hopefully to finalize the lease and uh, and. Uh, work with them to get them uh, their programming started up again. So that should be Thursday. So hopefully uh, Thursday will uh, bring conclusion to that and get moving forward on that. So I think that's about it. So Dave, why don't we move on to the public hearings? Okay, our first public hearing is, it goes along with item number three, which is a bond ordinance authorizing financing for the cost of payment of settled claims against the city in the matter of Wenger Construction Company, Inc. versus City of Long Beach, stating the estimated total cost thereof of $750,000, appropriating said amount therefore, and authorizing the issuance of not to exceed $750,000 bonds of said city to finance said appropriation. All right, and I believe our outside council was supposed to Join us for this. Mr. McCabe is on. One second. Let me just text him really quick. No, he's he is on. I'm just I'm just I just asked him to unmute. Yep, I see him. Can you hear us, Ed? Uh, it's, I believe he's having some sort of audio issue. Oh, there we go. I see a microphone on him now. Hello? Yep, we yep, got you now, Ed. You got me? Yes. I don't know why I can't see. I could see you before. Can you see me now? Uh, no. Is your camera on? Should be. Uh, okay, we're not see at least I'm not seeing you. I didn't have him up as panelists. I just moved him up to the panel, so now your camera should work. You can go ahead and turn your camera on. And you just remote muted your mic. 
I'm actually due to unforeseen circumstances on the phone tonight. So. Oh, okay. All right. So I guess we're not going to, we're not going to see you then. You're not going to see my lovely face. Okay. Uh, so could you just, uh, obviously, you know what you can and can't say, but, uh, can you just, uh, explain to, uh, our residents, uh, what this was about and what we're doing here? What we're proposing yes. to do? In, in essence, what we have is a lawsuit involving, uh, the rehabilitation of the firehouse, which was done approximately 12 years ago. Uh, the lawsuit's been pending basically for the last 11 years. Uh, we've agreed it was in essence a delay claim and that when the contractor took down the brick facade, the CMU had been seriously damaged, uh, which led to in essence a six month delay in the construction of the project. Uh, we did meet with the court and had Judge Wachowski mediate the case. After that, uh, we were in essence able to come to a settlement. Uh, the settlement was $750,000, more than 50% of which, unfortunately, constitutes interest in that this case has been going on for 12 years. Uh, basically, we had the hindsight of Judge Wachowski, who was the mediator, and the hindsight of the trial judge, Judge Steinman, based upon the their input as well as our analysis and dealing with our engineers and that this case is 12 years old. Uh, we think it's a good settlement for the city. Okay. Um, are there any questions from the council members? Um, Ed, this is Mike Delory. What was the rate of interest that was uh, accruing on the penalties? Was it nine or 10? It's 9%. That's statutory. Statutory. Okay. And that's been running for 10, roughly 10, 11 years. Yes. So that's in essence led to, a, it's been over 10 years. So it's led to a double of the settlement. I mean, the exposure that the city now faces, if everything was to go wrong for them in this case, is close to $2 million. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from the council members? I just have a quick question. Um, Mr. Lester asked at the last meeting, what were the total uh, co uh, legal costs for this case? Uh, did he receive an answer? Uh, I, didn't, I did not give him an answer. If he requires an answer, I, I will give him that. Okay. Um. Also, Karen, uh, uh, not too long after that, that's when we had our computer computers go down for two weeks. So we will get an answer to, um, to Roy. All right, any other questions from council members? All right, hearing none, uh, Dave, who's first? Roy Lester. Of course. Go ahead, well, Roy. Come on, come on, Roy. Okay, um, yeah, I, I, thank you, Karen. I am a little disappointed I didn't get an answer to that. I, I, you know, this was, I asked that after the computers had gone down and, uh, you know, that nobody knows basically off the top of their head what, you know, we're settling this case and we don't know what we paid in attorney's fees. It's kind of um, offsetting. And also, I, you know, I appreciate Mr. McCabe's um, explanation, but I keep going back to the appellate division where it basically said that the city wasn't at fault and, uh, you know, that the delay, it just seems that the city had a really good case. But as uh, Rick said last time, I don't know everything. It, it's just all the appearances are that the city had a really good case. And, you know, it, and the, the fact that we have to pay interest on a settlement that kind of blows me away. You know, if you settle, you settle. You don't give them the interest then too. But regardless, um, what I'm trying to figure out though is why we have to bond. And, and I know it's a lot of uh, money, but if you look at our budget, we, talk, we have this thing called the risk retention fund. And it's defined as a ri ri risk retention fund accounts for transactions and reserves set aside by the city to provide for self-insurance programs related to workman's compensation and general liability claims, which this certainly sounds like one of those claims. 
And it seems that we have about, or we had about $3 million in the risk retention fund. And the same question is going to go for the 200000 that we're going to be voting on. Why would we have to bond if we have that money in risk retention? And isn't this exactly what risk retention is for? Um, Dave, if you can move Ina up so she can answer it. And Roy, I just want to make you aware because you said that the computer system went down um, and you asked a question after it went down. It just came up for everyone on Saturday. Okay. That's why you didn't receive an answer because it just came up and everybody went back to work yesterday and, um, and everyone's catching up from two weeks worth of work. All right. Is Ina going to? I will. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, so I think that uh, Roy, you're talking about the risk retention fund. I think you're making an assumption that the whole $3.7 million that is uh, uh, budgeted in the risk retention fund is available for the settlement of um, cases like this. Um, about $2.6 million in that fund is actually earmarked uh, for the workers' compensation um, insurance. So, and, Ina, Ina, yeah, so just, just so I understand, you guys knew about this case for over 10 years and you didn't put money in the risk retention fund for, well, for any type of contingency like this? Okay, so this is a reserve that the city um, that the city is uh, um, budgeting for. Uh, on, on one hand, you want to budget as much as you think um, is conservatively prudent. On another hand, you budget as much as you think you can afford, right? So we budgeted about $440,000. Um, I have to tell you that me personally, um, I was not uh, aware or advised that the settlement of that magnitude um, is gonna be coming our way and uh, this money would have to come from somewhere, right? So this fund does not get funded by itself, right? So that means that we would have to increase an expense, the expense, it, it's budgeted. If you're gonna look, go back and look in the um, operating funds, this fund is getting funded by the combination of the general fund, water fund, and sewer fund budgets. So that means that if we had to include almost a million of dollars um, as an expense here, right, we would have to raise almost a million dollars of revenue in the other funds. And uh, we can go back and discuss like what's prudent and what's conservative and when the, the um, settlement was expected to take place and things like that. Uh, but um, I think that's my answer. But we knew we were going to have to pay it. I mean, it's when we bond, we're still going to have to pay the money. Only now we're going to have to pay interest on it. Okay. Listen, that's your answer. That's your answer. Well, Roy, Roy oh, yeah. this is my, Mike Delory. Um, yes. this, this case has been going on uh, roughly about 10 years. Yes. So I know what your point is that why didn't the other administrations put money aside to reserve this uh, possibility? I, I, I realize your point, but I'm looking at people on this, this video and most of us weren't even here during this whole episode. It's, it's, it's a very simple answer. When the budget was developed, we didn't know this was coming. This this settlement right. was coming. Mm -hmm. We didn't know. So. But you knew it was out there. The same with the Haberman. You guys know it's out there. But, Roy, but this case has been going on for over 10 years. So uh, then we could have budgeted for it. The previous administrations could have budgeted for it eight years ago or seven years ago. Or Absolutely. Would have been the prudent thing to do. Put a little bit aside every year. It would have been. Put 
okay. So then, then you're proposing we raise taxes for what might happen. Or spend less money, maybe, John. And put money uh, uh, aside for things you know are coming down the pit, the pike. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks. All right. We'll talk to you again in a second. So yes, I absolutely. All right. All right bye. <laughs> um, all right, Dave. We got anyone else? Yes, Eileen Hessian. Okay. Hi, Eileen. Go ahead, Eileen. You can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I like your jacket, John. Very nice. Thank you. Um, I'm still confused because I do remember when the firehouse was fixed that it was the fault of the construction company that things had gone wrong. And according to what Mr. McCabe said tonight, it seems like they did some damage and then they delayed fixing it. And we are at no. fault. Uh, I, I'll, I'll let him no. answer. Thank you. Yeah, no one's at fault. What happened was when the brick facade was removed from the firehouse, the cement block, which was found to be behind the brick, which was not to be removed and replaced, was found to be totally substandard. Okay. At that point in time, the city DPW under Mr. Kevin Mulligan, who was DPW director at the time, did not direct the contract to proceed, which is what he should have done. Okay, now when delay is not found to be the fault of the contractor, which it's not here because he found an unexpected condition, the way the law works is it's now attributable to the city. The city went back and forth with the contractor for nearly six months for directing him to proceed. So at a minimum, as the trial judge Steinman said, being aware of this case, we have a problem for that six months. Now, there were other issues that arose on the job, and there are claims that went back and forth. However, for that period of time, which was six months, which, you know, we have a daily carrying cost of interest for those damages for the last 10 or 11 years, we were going to be found liable. Now, there was a claim that we somehow got a favorable decision in the appellate division. I thought I heard that. We, we got a claim on a very small claim for unapproved change orders, which was for, I think, approximately $70,000 which was dismissed based upon contract language. So we did win that claim. The appellate division did not side with us on getting rid of the delay claim. In fact, the judges at oral argument completely disagreed with our point that it was not attributable to us. So again, just based upon the claims that are left against us, and keep in mind in this settlement, the last bill that Wenger was supposed to be paid under the contract, the last requisition, was never paid. That claim in and of itself amounts to $340,000. That's not an issue. We kept that money. I think at the time it was one hundred and fifty or one hundred sixty thousand dollars, and with doubling it, that's where you are on that claim. That's a that's a requisition that the city can't deny that it did not pay. So on the delay claim, in essence, the case is really being settled for about three hundred something thousand dollars, three hundred three fifty. But then we got the interest on it. Well, no, that's with the interest. Right. Oh, with. You Same as Haberman. This, this case is settling for 350, you know, 375. This case, for, what's the 750 then? 750 is the interest. You, you're taking oh, anything. Okay, so there, yeah, the interest. Well, why do we let these things hang on like this? And I know, Mike, you said it's not your fault. I get it. It's not your fault. Can I briefly? The past that? administration, but God, seven. We're bonding for almost forty million dollars tonight. Can I can I just put one more just, point? That thank Edward, you. Uh, the, hey, the let me just mention was, one thing quick to Eileen is that Eileen, I look at it this way: this nine percent running is ridiculous if there's a reasonable settlement offer out there, and if you bond it, I'm guessing we could get a rate lower than three. That that's what I'm guessing. I don't know the facts. I'm, that's my that's what I'm assuming. Well, I'm looking at what our taxes will be on this $40 million bond. It's not going to be 2%. Eileen, Eileen, you, that's a separate issue. And that's money where that the we're getting paid through grants. So we'll, when we get to okay. that issue, okay, okay. we'll talk about that. But what this is, is what I just heard Ed say is it is the final payment that the city withheld from the contractor. 
It is the settlement then for the delay. And then the interest basically doubles it. So it sounds like it's about 375,000 was the final payment that was withheld. Then about whatever, about 175,000 for the delay. And then the rest, the other half is interest. And the well, interest it, is- And, and the, the 355 interest, would include the interest on the, the okay. bill that was not paid. That's, that's, I want to be clear on that. Right. So, and the okay. interest, that 9% interest is, that's mandated by the courts. That's not a negotiable point. That's a right. legal thing. All right. And would I be right in saying that this has to do with administrations that came before yours? Well, this happened 10 years ago. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Before it appears in social media tomorrow, I thought we'd make that straight. Oh, well, thank you. Well, we'll get blamed anyway. That's what they do. <laughs> all right. Thank you for all the explanations. Thanks, Eileen. Okay. Uh, anyone else, Dave? Yes. Kathleen O'Leary. Hi, Kathleen. No, oh, we got a picture of Kathleen. All right. Ah, okay. Love the jacket. Thank you. I just have a question. Um, I, I know this is falling on past administrations, but I guess my question is, what had the corporation councils done before on this case? Who was the last corporation council to work on this? And why was it left for 12 years? I'll let Ed answer that, but my guess yes. is it just takes time to work its way through the court system. Okay, yes. Initially, what happened was we did discovery, which is generally a two or three year process that involves all the depositions. There were literally tens of thousands of pages of documentation that were exchanged. We then made motions before the court, in our case, to dismiss their claim in their claim for summary judgment saying they felt on certain issues, they should, the court in essence said, look, there are issues of fact here. Okay, and it took about three and a half, four years to get through this process and that, you know, we think this should go to trial. At that point, you can either pursue an appeal or not. Uh, the city chose to pursue an appeal. Okay, and the appeal papers, I believe were filed in 2015. Uh, I believe it was argued in 2016 and in essence, a claim was dismissed by the appellate division. However, the case basically sat in the appeal process for about over three years, uh, where there was no work done because there was nothing to do. Uh, once a case goes into the appeal process and you file the appeal papers, you go down to Brooklyn one morning and argue the case before a four-judge panel. And other than that, there is no work to be done. So that's kind of the way the case sat. And I didn't have very much contact with the corporate counsel after the appeal was argued because we were waiting for a decision for a, a substantial period of time. Okay. Um, uh, Ms. O'Leary, I would just, uh, you know, you, you asked a really good question. <laughs> and, um, I would just say that I really don't think it's a coincidence that a lot of these settlements are coming up to date now that we have an active city manager that is managing the entire portfolio very well and bringing these issues up to the council's attention. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, Kathleen? No, not now. <laughs> okay, have a good night. Well, well, we may talk to you again. All right, anyone else, Dave? That's all. That's it for now? Okay, let's, uh, we'll close this public hearing and move on to the next one. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Our next public hearing is for item number four, which is a bond ordinance authorizing financing for phases one and two of the flood protection for major critical infrastructure project, stating the estimated total cost thereof is $33,500,395. Appropriating set amount, therefore, and authorizing the issuance of not to exceed $33,500,395 bonds of said city to finance said appropriation and further authorizing any amounts received from the United States of America and or the state of New York to be expended towards the cost of such projects or redemption of any notes and bonds issued therefore or to be budgeted as an offset to the taxes for payments of the principal of an interest on said bonds and any notes issued in anticipation thereof. Boy, that is one run-on sentence. <laughs> and that's one of the shorter <laughs> ones. <to me. laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I'm assuming uh, Mr. Mirando was going to update us uh, on this.
You muted, John, by the John, way. Go ahead and unmute. Okay, so uh, this is the critical infrastructure bulkhead project that's going to put a bulkhead uh, to the base flood elevation uh, from the rec property uh, all the way past the wastewater plant, the water treatment plant, uh, the Long Island Railroad, the Long Beach Bridge, and uh, run up past the tennis bubbles and connect to the bulkhead at the Nassau, uh, South Nassau Community Hospital uh, property. Uh, this is a FEMA approved project uh, that we had been working on, and um, this will include a 33 million gallon a day stormwater pump station, which will uh, significantly improve stormwater runoff in the area between uh, uh, JJ Evans and uh, Long Beach uh, Boulevard. Uh, on May 14th of 2019, we got final approval to go ahead and bid the plans from the New York State Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services, or DISHES, who represents FEMA here for that, uh, in the amount of $20 million uh, for both engineering and construction. Project was let out to bid, and on uh, November 14th of 2019, we received bids, which was significantly over the $20 million that was approved. Uh, myself and Joe Fabrizio negotiated with the sole bidder uh, to reduce the cost by $1.6 million. We then submitted a request to DISHES or the Department of, uh, of, of Homeland Security and Emergency Services uh, to uh, show that even at the increased cost, the cost benefit of the project was still a positive, meaning that the benefits far outweighed the cost of the project. And then on October 29th of this year, through FEMA and through DISHES, we received approval for the project for an amount of $33,560,395. And while we have to uh, issue a bond notice for the full amount, the way the contract will work with FEMA is this will be about an 18 month project once it's awarded. Uh, and when we submit bills on a monthly basis to FEMA, FEMA will reimburse us as the months go by, as opposed to waiting till the project's completely done. So in our estimates, we'll probably end up doing a ban for the 18 months and maybe total not to exceed about $10 million, but we do need to, to issue the bond authorization for the full 33,560. So uh, when all's done and said, we really should only be paying interest for the 18 months that the project takes place. Unless there's any other questions, that's really kind of sums up this, this request. Okay, so because again, because Eileen uh, asked this question in, in the last round. So this is, this is being paid for through state and federal grants to us. The, the only cost to the city is the the interest on the basically the short term borrowing during the project, correct? That's correct. Okay, so we're, we're just bar we we have to authorize the borrowing of the money now because the city has to front the money and then gets reimbursed. Right. So, John, in the beginning of the project, there'll be some mobilization cost, and uh, uh, that probably will be in the neighborhood, if I would I guess, about three and a half to five million dollars, and we would probably go to a band for that, submit those bills once approved by FEMA in the following month, they would pay us for that. And then we would start to use the money that comes in from FEMA to pay the next bills going forward. Right. And the, and the money's borrowed usually uh, kind of on an as needed base, not like we're borrowing 33 million at once. So Correct. the interest uh, is just really on we're borrowing what we need at the moment. So we're only paying interest on that much lesser amount. Right. Okay. So uh, any other questions from the council members? Um, I just have a question and a comment, Commissioner. Uh, the comment is um, great job. I know it's a lot of work. It's been a project. From what I remember uh, months, months, if not years ago, the initial cost or estimate was about 20 million, which was found out later was extremely low to, to the reality of what was needed. And therefore, I'm guessing you and Joe Fabrizio and others had convinced the, the 
FEMA and dishes of why the project is approximately $33 million. So if I'm correct on that, I just want to thank you for that. Um, and the other is, this is the North Park area, basically flood protection. And it will be at the height that's the base flood elevation, similar to where the other heights of the bulkhead are. That's correct. It'll be designed. It's it's designed already to the hundred year base flood elevation. But not only will this in a major storm, but you know, even during uh, significant rainfalls of one two inches, we get significant flooding in in the uh, North Park area. Uh, particularly down around the MLK Center and uh, the J.J. Evans in that area. Having that pump station there will, will keep those areas from flooding during these, you know, uh, significant normal rainstorms, you know, above and beyond worrying about hurricanes and storm surge. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from the council members? Yeah, I just have a, a few questions for Commissioner Miranda. Please. Okay. Um, Commissioner Miranda, basically this project was already approved as part of the capital project plan. Is that correct? The, well, it was approved at the uh, $20 million level. So there, there will be a, uh, a request uh, to, uh, to increase the capital budget also just for record keeping purposes. Uh, by, by the 13 million? By the 13 million. I believe we did that at the last council meeting. Okay. And then, is there a net difference in terms of uh, cost to the city because of interest payments? Is that is that what you're no, saying? No, because even under the even if the project had come come in at 20 million dollars, it would be under the oh, state. Uncle. We would only we would only do a band for for what we would need for the first month's payment. Mm -hmm. and then be reimbursed each month by FEMA, and that would pay the, the following bills. Uh, okay. Just so, so people understand why the corporate went up, this project started being designed in about 2015. It has been, and, uh, been significant time-consuming negotiations with the Long Island Railroad because part of this uh, involves... Um, designing a floodgate system under the railroad tracks. Additionally, there was a lot of negotiations with the town of Hempstead because of the way the bulkhead has to come out to, uh, to meet the bridge. Uh, the town considered that their property. We had to negotiate a purchase of a small piece of property from the town. Uh, and in addition to that, we had to work with National Grid uh, because as you know, as part of this bulkhead, they have a significant uh, 48 inch high pressure gas main that runs through Long Beach that feeds about 500,000 people. So, um, and that's one of the reasons we had such a high cost benefit analysis. Uh, in addition to this, this is gonna replace all the utilities, gas, sewer, water, along River Avenue, uh, River, River uh, Drive, uh, which you know has suffered significant erosion and has probably put a lot of those uh, utilities at risk. Right, we've been suffering a lot of, uh, uh, we've had several uh, like sewer and water main breaks along Riverside, right? Correct. Yeah, Correct. so this, this is desperately needed work. Absolutely. I think this is one of the most critical projects that the city is, is undertaking. Well, just the, uh, yeah, and for, for controlling flooding and everything too, it's gonna be, uh, very important. So, uh, Karen, is that you got more, Karen? Yeah, I 100% um, support support um, Mr. Miranda's assessment. I wouldn't think otherwise. I was just trying to quantify the difference for our records. That's it. Yeah, no, the difference in the in the project is approximately uh, thirteen and a half million dollars. Is the John? Increase. John, this is. Ina, you muted yourself. Hi. I think hi. It's hi. Um, John, I, I guess like the question is, 
because the whole the the cost of the whole project had increased from twenty million dollars to thirty three million dollars. But um, in any case, either under twenty or thirty three million dollars scenario, we will only ever have to bond a portion, right, of the total cost. That's, so that's will the, right. So did the portion that we have to bond increase from tw from the twenty million scenario to the thirty three million scenario? Other words, like. Did we have to borrow $5 million if it would be $20 million and now we have to borrow seven or that whatever you call that, that phase when you have mob, mob, mob mobilization phase and, and that's basically what we're going to be borrowing for that didn't uh, change. I, I, would th I would think there might be based on that maybe a 20% increase in that amount. Because okay. based on the overall project cost, we you know once we award the contract too, we will get a schedule of values from the contractor. Once we have that schedule of values from the contractor, we'll have a better feel for how the how the billing is going to come in. And and you know you know um, Mr. Miranda, that's an assessment that I can totally understand and support. So thank you. You're welcome. Okay. You done, Karen? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, any other questions from council members? All right, hearing none. Dave, uh, who do we got from the public? First up, Roy Lester. Okay. Go ahead, Roy. Go ahead, Roy. Come on, always first. Be, be, just, the, just the order is on the screen. Okay. Because uh, you're number one in our book, Roy. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, first question cost overruns, they are our responsibility. Uh, we have built into the contract a contingency in the event of any cost overruns. All so cost overruns or only a certain percentage? A certain percentage. I believe we put in in this one, and I don't have the contract right in front of me, but we generally put anywhere from 5 to 10%, and I think right. based on the size of this project, we put in 10%. So the overall cost of this project could come in a lot lower than the $33 million also. And But it could come in if we have higher cost overruns. I guess what bothers me is once again, there was only one bidder on a project this size, only one bidder. Well, you what, know, and I just well, wish we could get more bidders. Well, it's interesting because we only got one a bidder for the general contract. Uh, we did get nine bidders for the electrical work that has to do with the pump station. So there was significant interest. One of the problems here is that a lot of the uh, some of the people that would sub for the bulkhead to do the bulkhead portion of this project aren't union, and therefore uh, the main contractors wouldn't use them because they're non-union. So this kind of limited the number of people that were available to bid. Uh huh. And what is the cost of the bond? I know we have to pay bond council and stuff like that. Each bond has a cost. I'll, I'll defer to Ina on that. Okay, and then I have one more question after that. All right, go ahead, Ina. Okay, um, I would have to uh, give you an estimate. I think uh, the cost of issues, um, it, um, it depends on how much is going to be bonded, right? It's based, portion of it is a fixed fee and portion is based on how much uh, is going to be borrowed. Uh, I anticipate that if we were to bundle all these projects that we're all this authorizations that we're talking about, um, our cost of issuance is going to be anywhere between thirty and forty thousand dollars. That's it for the attorneys and everything. For the attorneys and everything, yes. Okay, I'll hold you to it. All right. And oh, finally... don't hold me to it. <laughs> don't hold me to it. No, uh, I, as I said, it's my estimate. Okay. And finally, in the um, capital improvement plan, you said capital projects for 2021 will include 39 million nine hundred forty-four thousand four hundred in FEMA and other grant funds. Was that including the 33 million, or is that including the 20 million? That that included the 20 million at that time, Roy. Okay, so I, had, the project hadn't been bid yet, so okay, All been right. bid, we hadn't negotiated a. a increase with the FEMA yet. Okay, I have five, sorry, one last question. 
and going back to the Indiana Firehouse, I would think that when somebody bids on something that they know the underlying surface. Not, not, you know, necessarily, not necessarily in that firehouse. I mean, I wasn't here for the project. Well, I, I'm not talking specifically about the firehouse. Well, but the, because, this, like, I mean, you mentioned the firehouse. When you yes. read the brick facade, you don't know what's under that facade because the, the cement unit blocks in between, are, on one side they have sheetrock and uh, studding, and on the other side they have brick. So when you take that down, that's what you find that's under it. There's, there's a, I think on this project, there's really a lot less hidden things that are going to come up. It's, 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 well, it's a big project. It's, a, it's actually a pretty straightforward project. From you your know, mouth to God's re- ears, John. We're not rebuilding something that exists. If we were rebuilding something that exists, then I'd be more concerned about hit, hidden cost. Okay. All right, thank you. So, Roy, after all this, is it worth it? Should we do it? John, the fact of the matter is we still have the rest of the city that the water is going to come in on. And that's what I keep saying. You can't put high bulkhead on one side and low bulkhead on the other side and think you can put a sign up saying water do not enter here. Yeah. I would love to see the whole city bulkheaded. So would we all. We just, don't, we just don't have the money to do it all. Uh huh. So we're doing what we can. Yep. So. All right. I'm sure we'll be talking to you on the next one. Yep. <laughs> All right. Dave, who's next? Eileen Hessian. All right. Welcome back. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, first of all, thank you for it not being $33 million. Whatever the number is, is better. So thank you for that. Uh, and then the main thing I wanted to say is exactly what Roy just said. We've been saying it for years that everything west of the water treatment plant and east of the tennis courts is going to be flooded if anything happens. We all know that. But since the hospital is building and has their emergency room just east of the tennis courts, are they being held responsible to build some bulkheads to protect their property? Uh, John, I'm assuming that's well for you. That's you know that's really not an engineering question, because it's really a political question. Right now, our code doesn't require that bulkhead be replaced to a base flood elevation of 100 feet. So there's a couple of things that the city may want to look at, and it's going to be a political decision. It's going to be a political discussion is do we want to change our ordinance to, there's a couple of ways we could go. We could change the ordinance that says, if you replace your bulkhead or have reason to place your bulkhead, you can't replace it at the existing height. You have to replace it to the 100 year flood elevation. Or we could say, even make it more strict and say within three years, everybody must replace their bulkhead uh, to the base flood elevation of 100 feet uh, for a 100 year storm rather. So. That's really the only way to affect that happening is to, is to pass those kind of ordinances. And of course, those have some political fallout to them. Now, you know, to say we shouldn't do this project, when we have money to do things, we might as well take care of the things we can take care of on public property. Uh, we've just finished two of the canals uh, with bulkheading. Uh, we, in, uh, we finished West Bay Drive. We rose that, we uh, increased the height on that bulkhead by two feet. Uh, and in, uh, once the spring comes again, the contractor on that North Shore bulkhead project will be back increasing the heights of all the dead end streets uh, on, um, on, on in the West End on the state streets. So those bulkheads will all be raised to 100 year elevation. In addition, we have a drainage project that's going to go out to bid in the next week or two, uh, which is being funded by GOSER, uh, which is going to improve the drainage in the area of uh, West Park Avenue between Nevada and New York. And that project is going to have also a, a similar pump station to what we're doing down on, on, uh, on, on Riverside. So all these things, well, they won't protect us completely. Well, we have the opportunity and funding from, from, the, from the state and from the federal government. We're taking advantage of getting those projects done. How we get the rest and the, and the, and the privately owned bulkhead to, to do that is really, again, 
a, a political question on how how much do we want to change our ordinances to affect that. Well, I think that all of those things that you just mentioned are good. I agree with doing everything in spite of you know the reservations on them. However, now that you mentioned that the canals were done, that means there is a very tiny area between the tennis courts and the canals that is not protected. And that is the hospitals area. Somehow we should insist that they get that done because it is a small neighborhood there that will be washed away if we have another storm. They, it'll be like a funnel to them. I don't think the hospital has been a very good neighbor. Well, I, I don't have any control over that. I understand, but I think the city might go to South Nassau and say, you took our money from FEMA and do something with it to help protect us. Yeah, but I, anyway, I thank I, you I, for I, listening. If, if you go to South Nassau and tell them they have to do it. First of all, like to John's point, the, the current code doesn't require them to do it. Um, and if you go to them and force them to do it, then you would have to force every homeowner along the waterfront to do it as well. You can't selectively pick. No, I'm selectively picking them because they took our $40 million and said uh, they would I, do no, something I, good I, for us. I No, no, I get that. But just what you're okay. proposing is not legal. So, Well, I think it's worthy of an ask. My second piece is, since this is about flood protection, I've noticed that they have built fences along the dunes. And I asked one of the workers who are building this beautiful fence, what is that for? And he said, to protect the dunes. Is this included in that money? And exactly what is that protecting? Uh, Do you know what fences I'm talking about? Yeah, you're talking about the one that protects the service road on the, John, you want to tell her or you want yeah. me to tell her? That, that project's already been funded in last year's capital budget. Uh, we tried to convince the Army Corps that uh, if just with the snow fencing that they were using, eventually the maintenance aisle would fill in with sand. And once the maintenance aisle filled in with sand, it would start to overtake the boardwalk, right. the natural progression. I see. So, so we got a permit from the uh, DEC to put in a sand screen that will do a, a much better job of preventing the dune from uh, moving into the maintenance aisle, which will do a couple of things. It'll provide for us to be able to continue to maintain the maintenance aisle, uh, you know, debris and things of that nature. And uh, we're doing that with our own staff. Uh, right. And they're doing a really great job. It's gonna take some time to get done. We have all the materials and supplies for it. We're just, uh, you know, it's gonna take probably through next summer to get it finished, but in the long run, it will do a lot to protect losing the dune. Uh, well, it looks beautiful. I was just wondering who's paying for it and um, exactly what it was doing, but it's really protecting the boardwalk. So that's Correct. good. And, it, and it's, it's the budget on that project is about $265,000 that was approved uh, in last, last year's capital budget. That sounds like pocket change. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thanks, Eileen. Uh, anyone else, Dave? Kathleen O'Leary. Okay, welcome back, Kathleen. Okay, you just have to unmute yourself. There you go. Um, I have to say, I know nothing about um, money, about how the money operates, but I had an idea with this project, I guess, um, for I Irene. Um, is it possible as the FEMA money is paid back to us um, could we pay down the bond that we're borrowing? And if not, where is that money going? What fund is that money going to go to? Ina, that was for you. Yeah. Okay, I'll take it. Uh, <laughs> Kathleen, Kathleen. Uh, so the final, so, so the money that will be uh, reimbursed, this, this is a grant. It's a grant that works on a reimbursement basis. So as we, let's say, going to be um, expensing $5 million and uh, requesting a reimbursement for $5 million, we're going to be receiving $5 million, right? right? At that point, what we're going to be doing, we're going to be using this $5 million for the next phase of the project. So the last payment that we should receive from FEMA 
when the project is completed and we don't have to pay to the vendors anymore, we will use this money to pay down the notes. Okay. And so that's the reason why we're not borrowing the whole amount. So if we use the whole amount, the FEMA reimbursement should be $33, uh, $33 million and we can get rid of the bond right away? Is that correct? We, but when, uh, when you're saying right away, I guess you mean at the on end. The project, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Ina, Thanks. this is Mike Delory. Hi, Mike. Just, I think what would be easy to explain was we're authorizing a certain dollar amount, which is $33 million. We're going to borrow for the first phase of the work, which let's say, example, it's $3 million. And we pay the contractor $3 million. FEMA gives us $3 million. And then we go on to the next phase of construction and we use that $3 million. And then we get reimbursed from FEMA. Is that, it's almost like a construction loan in the private sector where you're just borrowing? Or is that how I understand this? Uh, you understand it correctly, the concept. I don't know how construction loans work, but you understand it correctly. We will have to borrow for the first phase of the project, and then as we're going to be getting reimbursed. So the whole project is going to be $33 million, but we will never have to borrow $33 million, but just for what we will need for the first couple of months. Right. And uh, that will be de uh, determined by um, John's team. Right. And uh, then as we're going to be getting reimbursed, we're going to be using this money uh, for the um, for the course of the project. Right. So at the end of the day, we're going to be reimbursed thirty three million dollars. Right. But uh, we'll only have to, let's say, in your case, if we'll borrow three million dollars, but um, we'll uh, um, only have to pay from um, the FEMA core, FEMA reimbursements, $30 million, right? Because the $3 million we had borrowed. So the last, last $3 million that we'll receive from FEMA will go towards the repayment of the notes. Right, because I think sometimes people um, confuse the authorization to bond for this entire amount. It's, it's your authorizing, but you're not always asking for the money at that point, you're just doing piecemeal for the construction. Program. Absolutely, you're okay. absolutely right. Thank um, you. It, it's, uh, yeah, with the, there is a lot of authorizations that we still have from prior year authorizations for which uh, uh, funds were not borrowed. Okay, uh, anything else, Kathleen? No, I, I'm just wondering, could some of that money from, uh, we had done this in the past, could some of those bonds that we haven't used all the money on be used to cover some of these expenses so we don't have to bond as much? Um, basically, um, um, I, we can, but I would have to go to jail. Um, this would be against the, um, the uh, municipal finance law. When um, you, you see how much of the discussion we have over each project, so you cannot borrow money from for one um, project and divert the funding to the other projects. Okay, I would not want you to go to jail. <laughs> no, I don't want to go to jail either. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. All right, thanks, Kathleen. You're welcome. All right, anyone else, Dave? That's it. Okay, so let's close that hearing and move on to the next one. Our third public hearing is for item number five, which is a bond ordinance authorizing financing for various capital projects in and for the city stating estimated total cost thereof of $6,330,000, appropriating said, excuse me, appropriating said amount therefore, including the expenditure of $1,450,000 expected to be received in state or federal aid, authorizing the issuance of not to exceed $4,880,000 um, bonds of said city to finance the balance of said appropriation and further authorizing any amounts received from the United States of America and or the state of New York to be expended towards the cost of certain of of 
of certain of such capital projects as indicated herein or redemption of any notes and bonds issued therefore or to be budgeted as an offset to the taxes for payment of the principal of and interest on said notes and bonds. Okay, the next goal is going to be get you to read these in one breath. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is uh, the now the what was approved in the capital plan. So, uh, John, I don't know if you want to say anything on this. Yeah, am I still unmuted? No, nope, you're you're on. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is just to authorize some of the projects that we'll be planning. Um, this includes uh, five hundred twenty thousand dollars for road reconstruction. It includes four hundred thousand for road overlays, of which two hundred thousand will be uh, reimbursed to us through uh, New York State DOT for uh, the chips program. It includes a uh, bond authorization of $250,000 for engineering design for the Park Avenue Resiliency Project, of which we have uh, uh, received uh, $1,250,000 in grants, uh, of which we have to match. Uh, this will be a project that will um, uh, create some pedestrian safety and some uh, bicycle safety on Park Avenue. Uh, this will include um, 500000 for the bus station rehabilitation. This is for additional money that was needed for the repairs to the municipal bus garage uh, where, the, where we uh, have the parking garage by the railroad. Uh, this will include uh, repairs to the city hall facade in the amount of $750,000. This will include 320000 for building repairs down at the wastewater treatment plant. We need to replace a roof on one of the digesters. Uh, that's uh, that the uh, DEC has given us a uh, consent order on. Uh, it will include $190,000 in sewer system upgrades. This part of this will be spent on uh, on Boyd Avenue, where we just went out to bid for a complete uh, road work project. And it will include uh, sewer upgrades of uh, $600,000 uh, throughout the rest of the city. Uh, as you know, we have a collapsed sewer main on... Uh, on uh, Lindell that's gone, gone out to an emergency bid. Uh, this will include an additional 200,000 for the uh, water treatment plant for the separation tanks. This will include 150,000 for engineering design for new well number 19. As you may be aware, well number 16 has met its useful life and collapsed. Uh, it includes a million dollars in system upgrades. This will be towards the uh, walks project for water mains. Um, and includes 200,000 for a normal hydrant water service replacement program. And that basically sums up all the projects that this will cover. It's, a, okay. it's, it's about <laughs> out of the 6,330,000, 1,450,000 is actually through grant funding. So, um, Mr. Miranda, I've already approved this when I approved the capital plan last year, right? That's correct. Yes. Thank There's nothing, you. nothing new in here. Thank you. Yeah. All we're doing now is authorizing the funding for the approved projects. Correct. So, um, and obviously this is infrastructure stuff. If people want running water and want to be able to flush their toilets, um, this is stuff we got to do. So um, any other questions from council members? All right, Dave, do we have, uh, or should I just say, come on on, Roy? You got it. Okay. Come on on, Roy. Go ahead, Roy. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm unmuted, right? Yes, you are. Okay. So we're bonding for $4.8 million on this. 4.88. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's just sheer bonding and including the other million or 950,000. So today, tonight we're almost voting to bond, even though we voted on this project before, we're voting another $6 million, basically. Almost, almost $6 million. What does that do to our debt service? That's an Ina question. You're muted, Ina. Ina, can you, can you please, please talk? Please talk in reference to what was already budgeted. <clears throat> I 
as most of this was already budgeted as far as debt service. Also, I was also interested in our, our leverage ratio to make sure that we are in, you know, we are definitely within the realm of our, um, you know, our ratio between assets and investments. So I'd like to get yeah, you. Sure. Um, I think that uh, for that question, Karen, I'd have to do a presentation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're only, we've exhausted uh, approximately 27% of uh, our uh, uh, borrowing uh, capacity. So mm -hmm. we're far away from uh, the threshold and that's a good thing. As far as um, having, uh, uh, as telling you what it's gonna do to the debt service, how it's gonna increase it, um, again, I'd have to uh, do a full uh, presentation. I think just talking um, hypothetically is not going to be fair. Once this is approved, I will um, uh, get a better idea of the rates and duration of uh, uh, this uh, borrowing, and I can provide you with the concrete numbers. Okay. I was hoping that you were prepared for that, but I guess not. Karen, are you suggesting, I, I know we, we can borrow up to $350 million, you know, given uh, what the ratio is, which I think is a totally absurd ratio. You know, it would be like me living in a $10 million house. Um, I'm, not, I'm, not, what, I'm not saying that at all, Roy. I'm, more, I'm saying more that, you know, there's leverage ratios that municipalities should go by. And that, Do you believe that they're correct? And, Do you believe that, that we could sustain a $350 million debt service? I'm I mean, not, debt? I am saying that there's leverage ratios that municipalities have and that we, Long Beach, should follow the best practices of what the leverage ratio range should be. I lost and, you. So basically I'm saying if there's a leverage ratio, there's a range of what's accepted, generally accepted as best practices for, mu for municipalities. And that's where I defer to our finance team to let us know what those leverage ratios are. And as long as we're in those leverage ratios, I feel confident that we can pursue, you know, the, uh, the actions that we're taking tonight and, and, and going forward. Okay, di no disrespect, but I think the ratio of where we are allowed to borrow $350 million is totally absurd, and this town could never afford that. And to think just because the law says that, as Charles Dickens once said, if the law says it, then the law is an ass. Okay, we cannot afford that. I think, Mr. Lester, you totally took my comments out of context, which I'm kind of disappointed in. So basically, I was saying that there's leverage ratios that are assumed as best practices for municipalities, and that I would hope that our municipality will remain within that leverage ratio. I had nowhere in any way said that we should be at 100% of a leverage ratio. And the fact that you, of all people, say that I think that that should be the case is very disappointing. Well, I'm glad to hear you saying that you don't think that's the case, Karen. That's all I'm asking. Thank you. You, you, know, you know that to be the fact, Roy. So I'm disappointed you thought otherwise. All right, yeah, all right. Let's, let's move on because we got a long, long way to go in this meeting. Um, so uh, Roy, are you done? Yeah. Okay. All right, we'll talk to you on the next one. <laughs> uh, Dave, anyone else? Um, John Miranda has his hand up, but John, is that up? Yes, if I'm on. Yeah. Yep. Just wanted to point something out on, on, and just to support what Karen is saying. What we've been trying to do for the last three years with the capital budget is we've looked at the debt service that exists for the capital planning, and we've tried to each year come under the amount of debt that's coming off the books also. So we've been staying away from, in previous years, we had you know 10 and $14 million a year, uh, 10 to $14 million a year capital budget. So what we've been trying to do is look at this, this year there was uh, you know 7 million coming off, I don't remember the exact number, but $7 million coming off on, on capital debt 
for capital projects. And we tried to come in under that. And we did with the 6.3 has come under that amount of debt. And that, that's the way we're trying to get the debt down on the, on the capital project side. And Commissioner, this is Mike Delory. Sorry, John. I remember that vividly and I'm glad you here. You were here just to answer that because this year we're, bar we're paying off more debt than we are adding to debt. And I think the number was a million plus, but thank you for saying it. And I remember seeing it. So that's all I have to say. And just okay, another the last note of that, I just want to say that Ina and I will put a presentation together because we don't want to confuse the community about the amount, what we're borrowing for capital projects, where we can show what was budgeted for, what the plan was, where we are, um, and so that everyone gets a better understanding. So we will, um, Ina, you and I will talk tomorrow so we can put something together to present at the next, uh, at the next working meeting that we can go through or at the next council meeting. Yeah, and the other thing, the final thing I'd say that's worth just noting is one of the things we started doing different this year is we started putting things in the operating budget that for a long time had been going into the capital budget but should not have been going into the capital budget. It was sort of done as a way to, for lack of a better term, hide the true operating costs of the city by hiding things in the capital budget. And now what we're doing is we're putting things in the capital budget that belong there and the things that should be in the operating budget are going in the operating budget. So, um, all right, uh, Dave, anyone else? Nope, that was it. Okay, let's close that public hearing and move on to number four. Okay, our last public hearing goes along with item number six, which is a bond ordinance authorizing financing. For the cost of payment of settled claims against the city in the matter of Herschel Allen versus City of Long Beach, stating the estimated total cost thereof is $200,000. Appropriate <clears> that amount, therefore, and authorizing the issuance of not to exceed $200,000 bonds of said city to finance said appropriation. Okay. Um, I guess uh, I see Chuck's on. Uh, Chuck, can you uh, again? Like we did earlier, just explain uh, people uh, a little bit about this case and uh, what we're settling here. Okay. This is or was an action for personal injuries arising out of a slip and fall down steps that lead from the beach to a bathroom that is underneath the boardwalk, National Boulevard. Uh, there were allegations that the steps were uh, not maintained correctly. There were allegations allegations concerning the placement of showers near the steps, which got them wet. And there were allegations regarding the inadequacy of a, a, a handrail. These were issues that, um, you know, raised a question of fact in the court's mind. Uh, we had moved for summary judgment, received a, a decision not, not very long ago, actually, uh, denying that motion. The injury sustained by Mr. Alon was a shattered patella, uh, that required open reduction uh, and internal fixation um, surgery. Uh, he went to perhaps one of the preeminent orthopedic surgeons on Long Island. Um, we had him examined by a physician as well, another very well-respected orthopedic surgeon who, uh, and that, that surgeon's report um, is reflected in our evaluation of the damages Mr. Alon had a nice recovery, if you can call it that, but he does have residuals and he will, re, you know, end up with uh, arthritis uh, through, through the years um, that, that will continue. He had a loss of range of motion that can be considered permanent. And he had the pain and suffering that goes along with having your kneecap shattered and put back together with wire. Um, this was a case that in our estimation may have been... Uh, you know, we may have prevailed at trial. Um, there were triable issues that a conservative jury in Nassau County may have felt that the city was in the right and that it was not the city's negligence that caused the accident. On the other hand, we had to deal with the fact that his injury is a substantial one. And, you know, I did legal research concerning values that the appellate division has pegged for these type of injuries 
and we felt that the injury's value itself was somewhere between five hundred and seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. It was also the fact that a, juries do what juries do. Uh, they don't research appellate decisions. Uh, they, they simply go with their gut and a runaway jury could have awarded this gentleman over a million dollars. I don't think that would have happened. Uh, and I think that's reflected in the plaintiff's acceptance of the sum that we did come to an agreement on. This case was conferenced with the judge, with Judge Bruce Cousins in the Supreme Court, New York, several times. And, and this is where we are. Okay. Uh, any questions from the council members? All right. Uh, you may as well just bring Roy back. Well, first is Eileen Hessian. Oh, she beat him out this time. She beat him out. All right. Go ahead, Eileen. You're muted, Eileen. I tried very hard to beat Roy out. <laughs> um, I was very against this. I was going to say, who is this guy and what is he suing us for? But I appreciate the explanation. My sister was on an external fixator, and I know that it is, you know, a serious injury and that he could have sued, sued us for more. I do well, he, wonder when he, he comes sue us for more. <laughs> When he comes to the beach, doesn't he expect that there's water everywhere? You know, there's personal liability also, responsibility. Um, but I guess 200000 in this situation is not so bad. I hate to say that. Thank yeah, you for the explanation. You're welcome. The, the personal responsibility thing does go into the evaluation. The jury could award a, a comparative fault to the plaintiff and probably would have. But uh, yeah, that, that's why the number is substantially lower than the, um, than the value of the injury itself. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Thanks, Eileen. All right. I guess now we'll bring Roy on. Next is Roy Lester. Hold on. I just lost him. Okay. Oh, there, there we he go. Is. There I'll you take. go. All right. Um, I don't understand. This is a smaller amount, relatively speaking. Nope. Oh. And we has gone. Hold on one second. Sorry, Roy. Yeah, you right. keep. I yeah. think it's deliberate. No, okay. no. Sorry about that. All right. This is a smaller amount. Why could this have not have come out of the risk retention fund? I mean, okay. we have the money there. Um, Roy? Yeah. Hi, it's Ina again. Um, yeah, so um, we had budgeted about $400,000 uh, towards settlement of cases like that. There are multiple cases that get settled throughout the year. And uh, we, we probably on average, uh, we go through $400,000 uh, just as we pay for the cases. Uh, that it's are, 600, uh, 600, Ina, average. But go ahead. Sorry, is it again? It's, it's 600,000 average. But go uh, ahead. We budget, no. Why? why no, I, I know what you budgeted. I know what it, the average is, but go ahead. So we oh, used that up already? I'm sorry. Um, okay. Um, so we won, we, we have um, spent about half of it. And also, I had. Um, um, I had the discussion with the deputy corporate counsel a couple of weeks ago, and there are a couple of cases or payments on the um, where we had the cases to be settled and payments um, um, that we owe installments on the cases that were settled before uh, that would add up to $100,000. So um, that would leave us absolutely with no funds in. Uh, remaining for the, through the end of the year uh, in the judgment and claims insurance reserve. Okay. Um, and, you know, I guess my objection is this again goes to debt service. Now, I can, can you explain to me why Michael said we have reduced our debt service? I clearly heard that. And yet the budget says that we increased our debt service by $633,000 this year. And I don't know if that's including the 4.2 money, 4.2 million we had to borrow 
and the other money we had to borrow for the pay uh, the uh, payout. You know, I don't know um, the I, actual I, debt I, I will try to explain it now. Um, as Donna said, we will have a comprehensive presentation for you next uh, meeting. So. Uh, there are two sides to the borrowing, right? There is a liability side, and then there is annual debt service. So, in I terms only asked the, about the annual debt service, Ina. That's um, because yeah, that's what comes I, out I'm of us sure. as taxpayers. That's what comes out of our pocket. Mm -hmm. So, um, when Mike was talking about the annual debt service. Was Mike talking about the annual debt service? I'm Mike, not sure Mike said that. the annual debt service has reduced, has been reduced. Mike was, this year. Mike, Mike was referencing the debt service associated with capital projects. Right. Well, that's Thank ridiculous. You. The debt Thank service is debt service. Thank you, John, for the clarification. Roy, I'll be yeah. happy to explain it to you, but not tonight. And what I said was in the budget, what we proposed in the capital plan with the authorizations and the bonding that went to these projects, we were paying down, planning to pay down a million dollars more in debt than we were borrowing. And I think it was, you know, we were borrowing six and uh, we were paying down seven, but the net result was about a million dollars. Also, you had mentioned about the 4 million too. That yeah. was after, um, I think the budget that we had prepared. Yes. So I don't see how, how we're going to be reducing the debt service this year. And like John just said, we were paying off things from the general fund in the, uh, in the construction fund, in the capital projects fund. So of course, if you move it over to the general, you're not really reducing the debt service, you're just reducing it on the capital projects. Isn't that true? Say it again. What's your question? I think what he's saying, because we, we put things in the operating budget this year that in the past had gone into the capital budget, mm -hmm. the capital budget comes in a little, comes in lower because things that used to get put in there aren't or didn't this year. So mm -hmm. that's, that's probably an accurate statement. Yes, because a lot of it stuff. It is was, accurate statement. Right. A lot but of stuff was pulled out of the capital budget. But also timing plays a big part in that. So if we were to borrow... Uh, this in February, there will be no payments made in this fiscal year for which budget we're talking about, right? The first principal payment will come the year after, so in February of 2022, and the first um, interest payment will come six months after the date that we'll borrow. So that specific, that specific borrowing will have no impact on um, this fiscal year uh, debt service. I, I think the salient question is, Roy, I, I actually agreed with you when I looked at this when reviewing um, reviewing this uh, tonight's packet. Do we borrow 750 or do we borrow 950 for the settlements? And you know, I thought that's a really good question. I'm like, why can't we just take 200 out of the general fund? But then I'm realizing is that this administration is working through all of the past, uh, past legal issues that we've had and that we're accelerating settlement of those issues, which in turn saves our legal costs on an ongoing basis, saves any potential interest for any future settlements. Therefore, I personally came to the conclusion that I was okay with borrowing 950 versus 750 for these two settlements. What is it going to, my because question. We are, because we are going to save money in the long run by doing so. Well, you do that anytime you borrow money, you know, to pay off a, a present day debt. But my question is next year's debt service, I do not see it going down, but I clearly heard that that's what you, is going to happen. I can't see how you guys are saying well, that next what, year's debt service will go down. Roy, there is a lot of components of the debt service, right? Um, so, so what we're paying now is the city and the debt service. We're paying principal and interest on uh, the month, amounts that were borrowed 10, 15, 20 years ago. So as your principal amount might go down, your interest 
can go up and vice versa. So as I said, it's not, uh, this is not a conversation that you can uh, like just have conceptually like that because it really, to me, it uh, really would be misleading. And I'd like to have uh, a presentation for you so you could see uh, that based on the actual numbers, okay? Okay. Thank you, Ina. Sure. Thank you, Ina. All right. You done, Roy? Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, anyone else, Dave? That was it. All right. Let's close that public hearing. And okay. uh, as we move on to the agenda, Dave, I want to move uh, item 10 up to first because we have someone that's been sitting on the phone um, waiting to explain that one so, okay. uh, so we can get them off. Sure. So uh, on to the regular calendar. We'll start with item 10, which is a resolution authorizing the city manager to purchase software services under New York state contract and to transfer funds. Okay. Who we have on the phone is Al Perez. Al. Oh, hold on. I got to find him on the list here. Okay, Al, was that you? I just gave the ability to talk. I think you're still muted, Al. And, and just so everyone knows that when we had the, um, the breach, Al, who uh, has helped us tremendously along with another company um, to get a handle on everything. And this is for the city to to move to Microsoft Office 365. I see Ron is on the phone. Ron, is um, Al with you? Hold on, I know on. he's on. I'll allow him to talk. Hold on a second. Ron, go ahead. You're, you're you're muted, Ron. Hi, hi, everybody. He's with me. He's right next to me. OK. Go ahead, Al. OK. Um, what we did was, well, what would you like me to speak about? Explain to... explain why we're going to Office 365 and how it will help the city in the future. Okay, so Office 365 offers a great deal of security and scalability. It's something that uh, just about every government, uh, especially federal and state, they, they've all really done it already. So in terms of security and scalability, that's, uh, that's a definite with Office 365, as well as a great deal of functionality and... Um, and um, things along those lines. Um, I'll answer any questions. Also financially, it's beneficial. Uh, you won't need mail servers anymore. There'll be cost savings as well as a benefit. And what we're asking for is it's a three-year contract and it's a government contract. The total is 71238.96. Um, it's 23747 per year. That's right. So what that is is called a, an enterprise agreement, which is uh, offered especially to governments. And uh, that's what those costs would be for, for that uh, EA. Is, uh, this is Karen. Yes. Is, there, is there a fixed and variable cost in this contract? Is there a fixed and variable cost? This is for the software. Right. So that's, that's, the software, the cost is fixed. So however many users, we, we can add 100 users. No, it's, it's based on your, your question is, I understand the question now. It's actually based on user count. So there's a specific license. There's a specific type of license. And there's a cost associated with that license. And, and the license count will, will impact cost. So if we have less users, we can decrease the cost in year two and three? That's correct. So, so even if we approve it now and we end up with less users, the cost can decrease in year two and three, right? That's correct. That, that, that's correct. That's correct. Okay. Is there and a maximum on the um, number of licenses in this contract? A maximum? No. Well, we what we we put in was about 175 like email users. That's what. And then, yeah, 175 email users, and then we have uh, uh, about 50 other users um, that for another piece of the software. 
So if we go under the 175, the cost will go down. Right. Correct. And sorry, and this if 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 this if this resolution is approved tonight, is yes. this something that we're gonna implement uh, right away or is this something down the road? Right away. We're gonna implement it right away, but that means within the next 30 to 60 days. Because we have to, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Al, I have a question. This is Scott Mandel. Yeah. Uh, you had mentioned that this is a, a program other uh, municipalities are using. Is this something that if we don't use something uh, along this line, we're at continued risk of something, another data breach, other um, failings? I would agree with that comment, yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. So is there anything that we're not gonna be utilizing anymore that will be an offsetting savings? From the IT budget? Yeah, right off the bat, you won't have a mail server anymore. So your your licensing for that would go away and the uh, the cost and the effort to maintaining that will would be reduced substantially. What does that mean, Donna? Yes, you'll have a savings. For the products that we're using that we will no longer be using. I don't have the exact numbers right now. Um, because we recognized while we were down that we needed uh, Microsoft Office 365 so that they will be responsible and it will be in the cloud. And so as we gather the other information, we'll be able to say this is what the reduction will be, um, that we no longer need um, the servers in the, in the different items, different software. Well, would it be okay if I said something, this is Ron Walsh? Sure. So uh, I have a an ability to take complex things like this and put it into layman's terms. So if I be so permitted by the board uh, to, to do that by the city council. Um, basically what you have right now is you have hardware, a hardware server, it's called an enterprise server in your IT section, in the IT room. That's an actual physical piece of equipment and you pay a license and you pay maintenance fees to keep that running. And you have to maintain it. Right, and you also have to maintain it. You have to constantly patch it. You have to constantly work on it. And so what happens is all these things go away with 365. Additionally, all of the, the firewalls that you needed to protect it, as well as the expertise needed to protect it, go away from the city. They become the problem of Microsoft because you're attached to Microsoft's cloud. All of your emails and all of these servers are virtualized in the cloud. So as, as, as safe as Microsoft is, is as safe as you are, which I can say from the experiences that we've had over the last couple of weeks is much, much safer for not only the integrity of your data, but also to protect it from being hacked or some sort of compromised by an agent who might want to try and get in here and steal data. So it not only raises the playing field for protecting the city, but it also can reduce the reduced overall cost because I don't know exactly what the email server would cost when you have to replace it, but I know yours isn't new. And when it comes up to buy it, it would probably be, I would think no less than 30 or $40,000 just for that server. So um, hey Ron, is my understanding that we are at the end of life for several of the items yes, that 365 would be replacing anyway. So if in fact we didn't go with Office 365, once they got the quotes together for all the equipment that is at end of life, then that would be an expense. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. The other thing is, is as you continue to live as a city and all of your emails get saved, you now have to store all of that data. Now you have a, a, a basically a data farm where you just constantly are, are keeping more and more data and more and more emails in, in, in perpetuity. So you don't have to do that anymore either. That all becomes Microsoft's problem. So the, the interesting thing about this conversation is that at the same time, we're talking about capital expenditures and operating expenditures within the same conversation right right now. That's so, right. So, so, so basically, I understand that we need to increase the, um, the operating budget by 23000 a year for Microsoft 365, which is a fabulous, wonderful addition to the city. So I thank everyone for making that recommendation. If there's any potential savings in other operating costs, I hope that they still remain dedicated to the IT department. And that I'm looking forward to a really, uh, you know, another robust uh, recommendation for IT for next year in the capital budget. Thank you. 
Thank you, Karen. All right, any more questions uh, from the council? All right, is Roy first? Roy's first. Okay. Okay, um, how much more is it per unit, per user after, what do we have, 175? Yes, it's 175. We did not ask for more than 175. The IT department and myself and Al and everyone that's been working on this thinks that the 175 is the highest number that we would go. If anything, so we didn't even ask how much it would be for additional? No, because we think 175 is the highest number. We think yeah. we would go below 175. Or we're going to keep it under, we're going to keep it at 175 or below. Okay. And is there a limit to the email storage? Um, I'll do yeah, this is how I can answer that. Uh, a typical Office 365 mailbox is 100 gigabyte. So that's it. So that's per, that's, per that's user? Massive. Per user. That's massive. So, and you have unlimited archiving. And who does the archiving? Do you have to do it? Or do you, it it's automated. You, you configure it to uh, archive emails, perhaps like after two years, it auto archives all that email. OK. I just, it, you know, I mean, Long Beach, welcome to the 21st century. We use it and, it, you know, it's really good. But the big question I have is, is everything going to be on the cloud then? I mean, do we have a backup for what we have on the cloud? Or is it just on the cloud? Okay, so I'm, Al's going to answer that again. So what you do is it's all basically configuration based. So what you'll do is uh, typically what government does is enable configure exchange to be in litigation hold nothing ever gets deleted and nothing ever goes away. And by default, uh, Office 365 and, and Microsoft Cloud Technology saves everything in triplicate by default. But what I'm asking is, do we have any hard drives ourselves? Do we have any service that- That'll be for different technologies and different products. Let's say, for example, the police computer-aided dispatch records management system. Um, there'll be some something called the domain controller. Um, there'll be, you know, a number of maybe file shares and things like that. But um, they will be servers. They will be hard there, servers. There, there will be some uh, on-premise servers. Yes. So if all of those are being backed up now, Roy. That won't change. Everything is being backed up now. Okay. I I just worry because every once in a while the internet does go out. And once that happens, we will have no email, we will have nothing. Not, that's just the way of the world. I mean, we have to live with it. Now, my question is, um, it's $23,000. We have an information technology budget of 574,000. How come we can't find 23,000 in that budget? And why do we have to take it out of the contingency? I think that, well, I mean, that includes staff, right? Yes. This is an IT budget for over $100 million a year. I hope we're spending that much on IT. Don't you? No. No. School district never spent anywhere near that. I, I respectfully disagree. Okay. Um, I find that a tremendous amount for, especially now, now if we're going to have so much on the cloud. Um, and given the, the state of our IT department, the fact that we got hacked the way we did or whatever it was called. And as Ina said a few months ago, we're still using systems like we people used 300 years ago. I find 574,000 a lot of money. And the fact that we can't find 23,000 out of that and we have to take it out of the contingency, it just, I guess it bothers me, but whatever. I'm, I'm okay. very, I'm, I, am, I can't tell you how proud we are that we are investing in IT. I mean, this is really a big deal. and It's and necessary, Karen. It's yeah, about I'm, time. I'm really proud that we're doing it. Aren't you, Roy? Yeah. This is great. I just wish we weren't spending all this money all the time. We have 574000 and we can't find 23000 out of that. That's all I'm saying. Roy, I'm not sure what you're complaining about. This isn't increasing the budget at all. It's moving money from one place in the budget to the other. It doesn't the, impact the bottom line at all. John, John, it's out of the contingency fund. 
the contingency fund is supposed to be things like if somebody slips and falls or if somebody well, Roy, the contingency <laughs> fund is really for the contingency fund is really for things that we need to pay for. So if we did not get this software and we were hacked and we could have gotten the twenty three thousand dollars out of the contingency fund. Are you I'm saying, not saying not to do, do it. I'm just saying okay. we have five hundred seventy four thousand in the budget. OK, All right. All right. thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, no, let's just, end it. This, this, this is complaining for the sake of it now. So let's. I actually have a salient point here. And the salient point is that 140,000 of the IT budget of 574 is actually for telephone and communication. So, you know, sometimes that will be considered in an, a school budget that might be in the office and administration area versus in, in, in our city, is considered in the IT budget. So I hope Roy, you would recognize that difference and, and know that only 280,000 are going towards IT maintenance contracts of the of this 574. So on a percentage basis of the entire budget of the city, I feel that is very reasonable and responsible. Okay. All right. You done, Roy? Yeah. Okay. We'll see you on the next one. Uh, anyone else, Dave? That's it. Okay, so let's go back to item one. And then Al and Ron, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you much, uh, Mr. Uh, Bendo, uh, President Bendo. If I could for a second, I know sure. you. I know you introduced me earlier, and I know that I'm probably going a little bit out of order here, but I just wanted to uh, let the city know, let you guys know how, how appreciative I am for the opportunity to come in and help to lead the uh, police department. I look forward to it. I'm very excited about this opportunity. And uh, I really feel that there are great days ahead for the city and for uh, the city of Long Beach Police Department. So I'll extend my thanks to the board and to the people of the city. And I look forward to working with all of you. Great. And we look forward to you being here. Thanks much. So, all right. And you have a good night. So uh, <laughs> let's go back to item one. Back to the top of the calendar, item one, approval of minutes from prior meetings, October 20th, 2020 and October 29th, 2020. Do I have a motion on this? I move to approve. Second. I do. Voting, Councilmember Um, Which, this is, are we doing both October 20th and the 29th? Yes. yes. Okay. I have a question on if on page five of the October 20th council meeting and it's um, I'm going to read the line and if this number is accurate, then I approve it, but I just I'm going to prove it with a question. Just to verify that the loyalty award for the amount of $4,786 in appreciation of the New York State Municipal Workers Compensation Alliance. The, if the uh, number is accurate, I approve. It, it's yeah. not, it's not, Mike. That's a good, I, we sent the correction in for that and it wasn't made. It was 40 something thousand dollars. I thought it was 40 something thousand. That's, yep. Sorry, I, I, I missed that too because we caught yeah, that last that. time and that's why we didn't vote on it last time. Because I remember somebody saying, so I will approve the minutes with the corrected number. Well, I don't know if we can do that because we don't have the corrected number. Okay. We, That's we, we, I don't know why that correction wasn't made, but so we might That's need okay. to table this. Um, I'm not sure either. That one, we went, we went over a whole list of corrections on that one. I'm not sure why that one was missed. Do you want, can we approve one? Like we can the, approve one the other minutes? one though. Can we do the uh, whatever? Uh, the sorry. 29th? The 29th. Can we do the uh, 29th? Because I have no questions for that one. Okay. Why don't we do that one? Okay. So if you need a motion, I can make a motion to approve the minutes of October 29th. Uh, do we need to withdraw the motion since it was for both? Yeah. Do, do you withdraw the motions? Uh, so I'll withdraw the motion to approve okay. both the October 20th and 29th minutes. And I'll propose okay. and propose a, a motion to approve the minutes for October 29th. Second, I'll second that motion. Voting, Councilmember Delury. Yes. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Treston. Councilmember Treston. Liz, you muted. Yes. 
Uh, Vice President McGinnis. Yes. President Bendo. Yes. Okay, item two is a resolution declaring the city of Long Beach lead agency for the Park Avenue Resiliency Project, declaring the project to con constitute an unlisted action and adopting a negative declaration. All right, is this you, Rich, or is this John? It's gonna be John. Okay. Okay, so uh, in the uh, authorization for the capital project, we authorized $250,000 to begin the engineering on this project for a grant that uh, involves traffic calming and pedestrian safety along uh, Park Avenue from Long Beach Boulevard to Lafayette Boulevard. Uh, this was the only on-listed project on the group of projects. All the others were, were type twos. So we could do a, a short form on this, which uh, we had uh, Nelson Pope Forres do. Uh, and after going through the whole thing, declared it non-significant uh, uh, based on the information analysis above, any supporting occupation at the pros actually will not result in any significant adverse environmental impacts. I mean, it's really a typical road project that just because of the traffic calming uh, aspects of it, that it was considered a unlisted action. So, so in order to uh, move the bond approval for the, um, for the capital projects, we need to uh, ad adopt a negative deck on this. Okay. And uh, Rich, I had, uh, when I reviewed it, there was, they had called Long Beach Boulevard, Long Island Boulevard. Is, is that uh, being updated? Yes, yes. I, uh, I followed up with uh, Nelson Pope. I just had access to the PDF, so I made the adjustment according to the, to the form. Okay. And the, uh, I think the other question you had was the bulb About out? Bulb, bulb out versus bump out, yeah. I think the two are interchangeable, and they both mean the same exact thing. Um, okay. So it was intentional. All right, that's fine. Uh, any questions from the council members? All right, hearing none, Dave? Nothing from the public on this one. Oh, Roy's letting us off on this one. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, hearing none, let's move on to uh, okay. item three. Well, I, item three is a bond ordinance. We already have the hearing on this item already. Item four is also a bond ordinance. We held an item, uh, 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 we held a, <laughs> <laughs> we held a hearing on this item already. Item five is a bond ordinance that we, we held a hearing on this item already. Item six is a bond ordinance. We held a hearing on this item already. Item seven is a resolution establishing base proportions in accordance with the provisions of Article 19 of the, of the real property tax law. Okay. Ray, Ray Flammer? So, yep, gonna have our tax assessor. Ray, I believe I unmuted you. Go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yep, we yes. can, Ray. Uh, good evening. Happy holidays. Uh, this is the annual legislation uh, to pass the adjusted base proportions. Uh, we are authorized by New York State to do so. Uh, the adjusted base proportion splits the tax levy into the homestead non-homestead class. Uh, it pretty much cuts off the tax pie into commercial and residential properties. Uh, we pass this legislation every year to keep it at 1%. Uh, if we don't pass the legislation, it would have to be a 5% shift and I'd have to adjust next year's taxes uh, based on that shift. Um, and this year, ah, sorry, this year it's shifting back to uh, homestead class. And this is for the tax year 2020-21, uh, which is, has already been established. It's a little late, but not the latest we've ever passed it. Um, that's pretty much what base proportions are. It just splits the tax levy into the two classes. Okay. Uh, so this is shifting it this year. So this comes from the state, by the way, right? This is not something the city determines. The state gives yes, us this. This is a complex calculation, which then gets reviewed by the state, the Office of Real Property Tax Services. Uh, it takes into consideration uh, the different equalization rates of both classes, physical changes, exemption, equalization changes, and it's based upon the reassessment from 1991. So every year since then, we've passed the legislation. Okay. Uh, do you just have any indication since it's uh, last year, obviously it shifted towards the businesses and, and we know we got some, some feedback about the impact it had on their taxes this year, it's going to be shifting slightly back towards uh, homeowners. Do, do we have a, just, um, I know it's, uh, it varies, but just a 
general how this impacts uh, a homeowner's taxes? Well, this year with it was built in with the tax change uh, the commercial properties was a, you know, wound up being a 1% increase while the residential properties were a 3.7% increase. Okay. Uh, that so includes, that includes any like physical changes along with any uh, levy increase the council passed. Okay. So when this passes, so this would be for the next fiscal year, correct? This would apply? No, this is for the actual current tax bill that people uh, are paying. The okay. All right, that's that that answer that. So it's not going to affect anybody this year. No. Okay. It already has. It, right. That's what I mean. It's not going to okay. impact them any additionally. No. Okay. Uh, any other or any questions from the council members? All right. Seeing none. Dave from the public. Roy Lester. All right. Ahead, but just real simple question. Is this, are we moving from the one that we uh, voted on on March 5th, 2019? Is, was that the last time it was voted on? Uh, correct. No, I think okay. we, yes, yeah. Every year we come up with, the, every, every tax year has a different calculation. So the base proportion went up then. Well, this one, it, it actually went down for the homeowners and went up for the business. Correct. Uh, for 2021, it went up for the homeowners and down for the businesses. Well, the, the one we voted on on March 5th, 2019, the home. That, I'm, home sorry, I'm sorry, Roy, that was for the 1819 tax year. Okay, so that wasn't the last one. So can you just tell me what the last one was? Sure, hold on. I'm sorry. I apologize. Yeah. Uh, last year, for 1920, the, uh, the homestead was. 0.742376846864 which was it shifting up and the commercial was 0.257623316 the year before had a 1819 had a lower non homestead or yeah. commercial 0 0.2411 all right so I, that, that's all i needed to know so it went up for the homeowners okay yeah all right okay thanks you're welcome okay uh, anyone else, Dave? No, that was it. Okay, thanks, Ray. Okay, you're welcome. All right, have a good night. No, he has one more. Oh, he has one more? Okay, <laughs> so we'll see you in a, and we'll talk to you again soon. On, on item number on item number eight is a resolution authorizing oh, settlement right. of certiorari proceedings. And I guess that's Ray right. again. Okay, uh, these are two tax certiorari uh, settlements. Uh, with the settlements, we don't have to pay for cost of appraisals or trial testimony or any legal consultants. Uh, also, in these both cases, there's no interest to be paid. Uh, the first one is the, the Aqua, the condo located on Lincoln Boulevard and the boardwalk. Uh, this settles four years, uh, 1718 through 2021. Uh, it settles for all 36 units, but only 12 units will get uh, assessment changes and refunds. Uh, all 36 units then have a moratorium for the following three years. Uh, the reductions are based on recent sales of other condo units and a couple of units within the building. Uh, the second case is the Oakwood Co-op, which is located at uh, 1 East Broadway. Uh, that's a refund of 40000 and a reduction of 400000 to three seventy on the assessed value. Uh, this is an eight-year settlement with a three-year moratorium of no filing of grievances uh, from 2021, I mean, 21, 22 through 23, 24. Um, yeah, it's, I think that's it. All right. Any questions from the council members? All right. Roy, uh, Roy, uh, I'm saying Roy more than Dave now. Uh, Dave, anyone from the public? <laughs> you were accurate. Uh, well, Roy there you go. <laughs> go ahead, okay, Roy. so when I look at the Aqua, it looks like they they assess the value at eighty thousand dollars. You know, that's just the assessed valuation, and it went down to sixty, which is like a twenty five percent decrease in value. Uh, and it, yeah, the. These condos, they're valued like 2.4, 2.3 million. And I'm bringing them down to 2 million to come in line with the sales in the Aqua and in other 
other condos that had penthouse sales. So basically, this the same people that own the Aqua. This is this is Ingo Bergman, right? Uh, this these are all private owners that I, I guess bought the, the condo units ten years ago when they right, were right. But it was it was built by Ingo Bergman, the same people that are doing the super block, the same people that sold us on this thing of how much money we're going to get because uh, the condos are worth so much money. I just wanted to make sure I have that correct. And yeah. yet it's right, right. This yeah. that. Engel Berman built the building. They're not involved in the Aqua anymore. So uh, what they are you sold doing? it. They sold it. They used this. John, you were there at the meeting when they were talking about the uh, the Aqua. I, I okay. Think and how? I think, Roy, I think you're saying. I think you're trying to say, for layman's terms, like me, they they are the same developer. Is that correct? Yes, they were. So they're the developer, and then they sell it after they develop it. My question is, are these things going down in value? It looks um, like they went down 25%. I don't think they're going down. down in value. These 12 units were just not properly valued over the past few years. Uh, the other 24 units are fine. And we were the ones that the, the city valued them? The city valued them, yes. And do you have any idea why we were so wrong? Well, uh, you know, the market change, the equalizations change, the sales that came out in the past couple of years didn't right. support the value for these properties. Uh, previously, maybe the sales did support back in 2015 and 14, but right. since 2017, the uh, market hasn't supported these values. Okay, so the, the question was, is the market changing so that they're going down? And that, Am I wrong? Is that not what you're saying? I, I'd say possibly that these 12 units didn't appreciate as much as the others. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ray, I'm, well, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, John, is, is anybody else waiting to ask a question? I, I don't know. No, nope, not at this time. All right. Um, Ray? Yes. Values change every year based upon equalization rate changes. So yes. you... You're given valuations from New York State of which you have no control over. And that is what you as an assessor or any assessor has to place on the, the tax, the tentative tax roll. So it, values yeah, correct, change, right? but it's not you're changing it. It's the state ratios are, are changing every year. Yes, if the assessment does not change, the, the state comes out and gives us an equalization rate. Uh, that changes on a yearly basis based on the current market conditions. Right. Thank you, Ray. You're welcome. All right. Uh, I guess on to the, you said there were no more uh, public speakers, right? Public questions. No, no more. No more hands up at this time. Okay. So up, up on to item nine. Item nine is a resolution authorizing the city manager to end to amend the city's intermunicipal agreement for the transport and disposal of municipal solid waste. That's Ms. That's Commissioner uh, Miranda. Okay. Okay. So, um, as at the end of this year, our contract for recyclables has expired. We had a, a great deal on recyclables doing single stream. We were paying two dollars and fifty cents a ton, uh, but due to changes in the market, uh, our single stream price would increase to eighty-five dollars a ton. Uh, with the present contractor. So we negotiated a new deal with them at the Sanitary District 1. Starting on January 1st, we'll be going back to separate streams for recycling. Uh, mailers will be coming out to explain it to the residents. Uh, one stream will be paper and cardboard, which will cost us now $35 a ton instead of $2.50 a ton. And commingled glass cans and plastic, which will now cost us $80 a ton. We had run these numbers by also by the town of Hempstead to see if we could do better there. Uh, they would, we were told we'd be up over $100 for single stream recycling. Uh, so we've uh, recommending a contract with Sanitary District 1, which will run for four years from January 1st of 21 to uh, December to, uh, 31st of year 24, 2024. Uh, there will be CPI increases in 2022, 2023, and 2024 
capped at a max of 4%. Basically, uh, we do about 3,000 tons a year of recyclables. We feel the breakdown on that is typically about 2,000 pounds of paper and cardboard, which would increase the cost of recycling for paper and cardboard by $65,000 annually, and about 1,000 tons of cans, glass, and plastic which would increase the cost uh, to about 82,500. So an increase in cost of approximately $147,000. However, we were able to negotiate uh, our previous contract on municipal solid waste regular garbage of which we do about 2000. We reduced that contract from the town of Hempstead by going to sanitary one by $10 a ton saving about 200,000. So the, while this is not good numbers for recycling overall, we are, we're still well within our budget in terms of, um, of recycling. Uh, we think it's a good contract. Um, there is opportunity within the contract down the road should uh, any of the markets come back to uh, renegotiate those prices. Okay, great. Uh, any questions from the council? Brando, this is Liz. Where is Sanitation District 1 located? Uh, it's located in Inwood. Uh, that's also an advantage, by the way, of going to Inwood. Uh, it's a much shorter trip for our equipment, therefore less wear and tear on tires going over to the town of Hempstead and Merrick, um, and less, you know, fuel and less uh, oil changes and things of that nature. Um, Commissioner Mike Delory, is there any single reason that you know of that the mixed paper rate went up so much or it, or it has not changed in so many years and now it's got to catch up? Well, I, there's just not a market for recyclables now. And what happens with uh, what's happening with single stream too, it's getting uh, very expensive to sort. It's very labor intensive. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's just become much more costly to do single stream. Mm. Okay, thank you. Ch China used to buy much of the U.S. recycling Correct, material, they and they they have stopped. Okay. So, and there's not a domestic market for it. Especially glass. Um, I just have a question, and I don't know if this is the right place, but for the residents and ourselves included, going back to separating our paper from our our cans and our bottles that are we going to have maybe this is the McNally question uh, a PSA on exactly what we need to do there, there will actually be a uh, calendar coming out in a separate mailing piece on res on on sanitation overall starting in January uh, we will be increasing our number of municipal solid waste pickups uh, Half the city will be being picked up on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So they'll get three, three dates of uh, regular garbage pickup. Uh, and the other half will be on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. This will cut down on, on much heavier loads that have been overpacking our trucks. Oh, okay. Sorry, commis Commissioner, I'm sorry. I think that's been amended. So the, the, the MSW is going to remain at two uh, okay. per week. Nobody told me that. <laughs> Okay, but is, are we still sticking with the five recycling? Um? Correct. Okay, so there'll be five recycle uh, areas now uh, was, um, where two trucks will be picking up on the same day. So each area, uh, each zone will put their both sets of recycles out. One truck will pick up the paper and cardboard and one truck will pick up the uh, bottles, glass and cans. Back in the day. Yeah. Okay, great. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, we've gone full circle on our recycling. Yeah. So, uh, all right, any other questions from the council? All right, who's first, Dave? No one. Really? All right. No, no hands raised at this time. Wow, okay, so right. on to item 11. Okay, yes, we already heard item 10, so item 11 is a resolution authorizing publication for hearing of an ordinance to amend the code of ordinances of the city of Long Beach regarding environmental advisory board. This item is for publication only. A hearing will be held January 5th at 7 p.m. On to the voting. And we'll start with item number two. 
me one second. Okay. Item number two is a resolution declaring the city of Long Beach lead agency for the Park Avenue Resiliency Project, declaring said project to constitute an unlisted action and adopting a negative declaration. Who introduced and moved the adoption of this item? I will. Second? I will. Voting, Councilmember Delury. Yes. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Treston. Yes. Vice President McGinnis. Yes. President Bendo. Yes. Item three is a bond ordinance authorizing financing for the cost of payment of settled claims against the city in the matter of Wanger Construction Company Incorporated versus City of Long Beach. Stating the estimated total cost thereof is $750,000, appropriating said amount therefore, and authorizing the issuance of not to exceed $750,000 bonds of said city to finance said appropriation. Who wants to just move the adoption of this item? I will. Sorry, who got that? Ms. Treston. Okay, who got, uh, um, Karen, you taking a second? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Voting, Councilmember Delury. Yes. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Treston. Yes. Vice President McGinnis. Yes. President Bendo. Yes. Item four is a bond ordinance authorizing financing for phases one and two of the flood protection for major critical infrastructure projects, stating the estimated total cost thereof of $33,500,395, appropriating said amount therefore authorizing the issuance of not to exceed $33,500,395 bonds of said city to finance said appropriation and further authorizing any amounts received from the United States of America and or the state of New York to be expanded towards the cost of such project or redemption of any notes and bonds issued therefore, or to be budgeted as an offset to the taxes for payment of the principal of and interest on said bonds and any notes issued in anticipation thereof. Who introduced and moved the adoption of this item? I will. Thank you. Second? I will. Sorry, who was that? Karen. Karen. Okay. okay. Voting, Councilmember Delury. Yes. Councilmember Mandel. Um, I wanna thank Commissioner Miranda, uh, Joe Fabrizio, the entire Department of Public Works. This is a major undertaking, a major project, years in the making. And we know it was an ever-changing playing field. You did a tremendous job, thank you. I vote yes. Councilmember Treston. Backing on Councilman Mandel, Mandel I do say yes. Uh, Vice President McGinnis. Yes. President Bendo. Yeah, great project. Uh, city could definitely use it. Uh, yes. Okay, hold on. I gotta switch pens. Item five is a bond ordinance authorizing financing for various capital projects in and for the city, stating the estimated total cost thereof is $6,330,000. Appropriating said amount, therefore, including the expenditure of $1,450,000 expected to be received in state or federal aid, authorizing the issuance of not to exceed $4,880,000 bonds of said city to finance the balance of said appropriation and further authorizing any amounts received from the United States of America and or the state of New York to be expanded towards the cost of certain of such capital projects as indicated herein or redemption of any notes or bonds issued therefore, or to be budgeted as an offset to the of, um, to the taxes for payment of the principal of an interest on said notes and bonds. Who will introduce and move the adoption of this item? I will. Second? I will. Voting, Councilmember Delury. Yes. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Treston. Yes. Vice President McGinnis. Yes. President Bendo. Uh, since I'd like to drive over a few less potholes and still flush my t and still flush my toilet, yes. And item six is a bond ordinance authorizing financing for the cost of payment of settled claims against the city in the matter of Herzl Allen versus City of Long Beach, stating the estimated total cost thereof is two hundred thousand dollars, appropriating said amount therefore, and authorizing the issuance of not to exceed two hundred thousand dollars bonds of said city to finance said appropriation. Who would you just move the adoption of this item? I will. Second. I will. Thank you. 
Voting. Whoops. Councilmember Delury. Yes. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Truston. Yes. Vice President McGinnis. Yes. President Bendo. Yes. Item seven is a resolution establishing base proportions in accordance with provisions of Article 19 of the Real Property Tax Law. Which you just move the adoption of this item. I will. Second. I will. Voting. Councilmember Delury. Yes. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Treston. Yes. Vice President McGinnis. Yes. President Bendo. Yes. Item eight is a resolution authorizing settlement of certiorari proceedings. Who would you just move the adoption of this item? I will. Second. I will. Voting. Councilmember Delury. Yes. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Treston. Yes. Vice President McGinnis. Yes. President Bendo. Yes. Item nine is a resolution authorizing the city manager to, to amend the city's intermunicipal agreement for the transport and disposal of municipal solid waste. Who would you just move the adoption of this item? I will. Second? I will. Voting. Councilmember Delury. Yes. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Treston. Yes. Vice President McGinnis. Yes. President Bendo. Yes. I am 10 is a resolution authorizing the city manager to purchase software services under New York State contract and to transfer funds. Who introduced to move the adoption of this item? I will. Second. I will. Voting. Councilmember Delury. Yes. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Treston. Yes. Vice President McGinnis. Yes. President Bendo. Uh, yes, this is needed. Yes. And finally, item 11 is a resolution authorizing publication for hearing of an ordinance to amend the code of ordinances of the city of Long Beach regarding environmental advisory board. I want you just move the adoption of this item. I will. Second. I, I will. will. Oh, Scott. Okay. President Bendo. Okay. Voting. Councilmember Delury. Yes. Uh, Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Treston. Yes. Vice President McGinnis. Yes. President Bendo. Yes. The city manager's monthly personnel report has been filed by the city clerk who will make a motion to close the meeting. Look at Mike sitting there all quiet now. <laughs> you know, I am going to make him, I'm going to make a motion to close the meeting, but there's going to be a time where I'm going to catch you at the end and just say, no. I will make a motion to close the meeting. Who will second? I, I will. Voting, Councilmember Delury. Yes. Thank you. Councilmember Mandel. Yes. Councilmember Treston. Yes. Vice President McGinnis. Yes. President Bendo. Yes. Okay. All right. So that's first hurdle, and now on to good and welfare. So uh, I think everybody knows the drill, but uh, yep, three. Folks, use the raise your hand function if, uh, if you wish to speak. Yeah. Dave, I want to thank you for reading all of that, those <laughs> resolutions, yeah. Dave. I really, uh, to say the least, those were mouthfuls all in the same yes, night. Yes, we, we, we need some longer bonds, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. All right, so who's up on deck? First up is Roy Lester. Okay. I'll try to be quick. It's late. I have a, a few questions. Um, number one, did you say you settled with the MLK, uh, all the problems with that? And uh, are we collecting our back rent or what is the rent or what's going on with that? <clears throat> also, um, the monthly scorecard, we were supposed to be getting that every month, but the last time it came out was in August. So I'm, I'm wondering what happened to that. Uh, and also, <clears throat> when it came to the uh, Wag uh, the Wagner decision, um, Ed McCabe said that we had not paid them the last three seventy five that they were owed. Did we put that aside, or did we just spend that when we didn't pay it? And the fourth one is: How come we can't have open meetings like uh, the school district? They're allowing up to fifty people, and is that just because of the elevator? And couldn't we move it somewhere else? Okay, that's it. All right. Uh, I guess ML. You, uh, well, I'll take a stab at MLK. Donna, you could jump in if you want, because I don't think Monique's on. Uh, um, so the, the MLK me. I'll 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 okay. But first, sure. the MLK. We're meeting with um, their um, 
people, um, I'm not sure, I know who's all gonna be on the call. Some of the board members will be on the call on Thursday. Um, they have the term sheet uh, for the new lease and no, it has not been finalized as of yet. And no, we have not collected any back rent. All of that is trying to be worked out as we speak. Thank uh, you on that. Next was the scorecard uh, since August. August was the last one. Um, Ina, I have to look because um, it's been updated since before August. So we have to find Yeah, Yeah, um, I was only today. Um, I actually were, um, found out that October, uh, the, the latest one that was prepared was October and it was not um, online. So um, I'll make sure that uh, it's posted on the city's website so you can go tomorrow and check it out. Okay, and then next was Thank the you. Wenger payment that was withheld 10, whatever it was, 12 years ago, was I guess that put in escrow and put off to the side. Uh, I think we all know the answer to that, but uh, Ina, it, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess it was not. And I'm guessing that was probably a very edu uh, well educated guess, but Ina, you're muted. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Can you please repeat the question? Yeah, the, the, the final payment that was withheld on the, on the settlement on the firehouse that we voted on tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, the final payment that the city withheld, um, was that ever put aside sort of into escrow uh, or it was not? I'm guessing it wasn't. Um, <laughs> I that's a good this question. Was, realizing yeah, this was years was ago. Um, not that I'm aware of, but uh, um, I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah. Okay, and the last one was about uh, the open meetings um, that the school district is doing it. They're getting up to 50 people. Uh, I know that I, they may have more space than we do. When we spaced it out up on the sixth floor, I think we were going to be limited to about 25. Don, I think it was 25 people, I think it was. Yes, it was 25 because um, with the staff and with the council, we would hit the 50 max. And a portion of it, the reason we weren't having it was because of the elevator or is because we only have one elevator. Right. We only got one, one working elevator. And at a time. Right. It's only supposed to be um, two people in it at a time. And we did try to go to other places and we're not able to. And we even tried to go to the school district and we're not able to because of COVID restrictions and all of the sanitation. Um, everybody is saying no. Right. It's not that they don't like you guys. Uh, last question, I'm sorry. Uh, is there any definition of what contingency means in the budget? I know you mentioned it. Uh, Ina said that that's not what contingency is, but most other things are defined. I couldn't find a definition for contingency, what the contingency money is supposed to be for. Is there a definition? Well, is there a formal definition for the contingency category? Yes. It's, uh, it's basically unallocated uh, funds that are set aside in a budget, um, just uh, at, 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 as it sounds, in a contingent, on a contingency basis. So um, each department uh, will uh, have an, uh, will have um, ability to draw upon those re reserves as uh, as needed. But they, when I said that there was $3 million in there. It, what, what are you talking about? You're talking about, the, I, I think we're mixing things here. That's when why I asked, that's why I asked if there was a definition. about the risk of attention fund, I Yeah, think. contingency was- oh, No, no, contingency no. Is is I'm sorry, can I, I'd like to be able to finish. Uh, contingency um, line item is in the general fund. Yes. The risk right. What you're talking about, $3 million, it's a different fund. You don't cross from one fund. And so I'm not sure. Is your question about the $3 million in the risk retention fund? or No, no. The no. contingency. Only the it contingency. I know what risk retention right. is defined. 
Roy, Roy, Roy. Yeah. Dep Department A1990 is called contingency. Is there, that the one with the three million? Yes, there's two components in the contingency department. One component is the termination salaries, which is the payouts for union employees that leave for their accumulated vacation, sick, comp time, or termination time. And that's roughly 2.5 million. The balance is called, in and of itself, is called contingency within contingency, and that is roughly 500,000. So that's where the IT cost came out of tonight, the 500,000 part of the 3 million. But the majority, uh -huh. the majority is set aside for termination payments. But we still bonded two million this year for termination payments. And correct, correct, because that see the financing part of that was already in the budget. I can I can send you the information that we can't we get so much in revenue from taxes and from other sources, but we also get revenue from financing for the termination salaries, which we all agreed upon when we passed the budget. Yes, I I know that. I'm trying to figure out. So we are. Contingency, you spent 2.5 and we bonded what, 2.7? So our payoff this year, our payouts were over 5 million? Um, actually, I went through a, a <laughs> Zenith scorecard tonight and we actually I, have, we actually through October have paid out of this department called contingency one point like one eight million dollars so far. So I think uh, Roy, you're up. adding yeah, Roy, you're adding expenses plus revenues. Um, the termination salaries were budgeted. It's an estimate of $2.5 million. Now you have a choice of either funded through, let's say, property taxes or borrow from it. For, but it wasn't right? property taxes because it's in the budget. Yes, exactly. That's what I'm, but that, that's But we revenue. also borrowed for it. No, 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 we, no, we, we only. I, I think, I think, I, what I think that needs to happen is that, unfortunately, Roy, we said we would get together and meet with you, um, because this is becoming very combative, um, because we're saying one thing, you're saying one thing. I think that the best way to resolve this is that um, now that the computers are up, um, Ina and I make an appointment, and you with you, and you can come in, so we can show you in writing. We can understand your questions and you can understand our answers because right now this conversation is becoming very combative. Um, and I don't it, mean it to be that. I don't mean well, it, to it be is that very combative done. and it, 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 yeah. it's starting to get very demeaning to my staff. So I would prefer that we all meet and that um, and any resident that wants to come in with you and me to get the answers, they're welcome. Thank you. No problem. Anything okay, else? John, I'm done. Okay, great. Have a good night. Uh, Dave, who's next? Chris Finkel. Okay. Go ahead, Chris. Hello. Hi, Chris. How are you guys doing? Uh, just a couple quick questions on the Long Beach Arena, the ice rink. Okay. Who wrote the actual RFP? An attorney. Is there a name or... Oh, yeah. The, uh, her name is Mary Sadowski. Thank you. Um, I only have a few questions. Um, second question. Who's on the committee to evaluate the bids' names? Uh, the committee will be the procurement, uh, legal, finance, and myself. Right. As a, who, I don't know who those... Ada I mean, I've, Resnick, okay. Donna Gaden, Rich Berrios, and Rosemary. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. And are the RFPs going to be open in a public meeting to show transparency and uh, to be evaluated at a later date? We can open the, uh, the uh, RFPs through a Zoom meeting. Okay, great. And just a couple things from the RFP. Will the city put up a performance bond and timetable for the work that they say they're doing, such as like I saw some with the FEMA and the flooding, Okay, Mr. Uh, Finkel, what you'll have to do is you'll have to send us those questions so that we can have those questions on record for anybody else that's, uh, that's responding to the RFP that's not on this call. Right. Okay. Uh, I, last, last two questions then, I guess. Um, so the rink's open now. 
is the revenue covering the expenses? Um, I'm not, Ina, do you know for sure? I know we're bringing in with COVID and everything that we've had to close down. I, I would have to take a look at that. Yeah, no, I'm not saying anything. I'm just, it's a question that, you know, I understand that we were COVID, everything is different, but is it I'm worth not it? sure we can look into that and get back to you. Okay. And, and the last question I had, so someone buying the rink, the lessee's response, I'm just, I'm just so I read it correctly. If I bought the rink. Mr. Fingal, I have to stop you. If it's a question regarding the RFP, you have to put that in writing so that we can provide that answer to all that are responding to the RFP. Okay. All right. Um, well, thank you for taking your time. Those were thank you. I'll, I'll look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay. Have a good night. Okay. Dave, who's next? Next is Kathleen O'Leary. And welcome back. Kathleen, you muted. There you go. All right. Um, this goes back about a month ago. Um, when the um, ADA rules were laid out on the agenda, I believe the last one was that if the city doesn't have enough money to do the ADA modification, um, that's the end of it. Um, I have experience with this at Nassau Community College. Um, I've been taking water classes and doing laps there for about seven years. And then all of a sudden the uh, chair to get in the water broke down. So for a year and a half, um, I had to cancel out of classes and I couldn't go there. So um, finally I uh, approached the state education department and brought a complaint for two conditions. One was the chair and one was the, uh, I think it was asbestos tile from the 1980s in the locker room, which was highly polished and people were slipping and falling. So um, if Nassau community didn't fix these things, these violations, um, they were gonna lose their state funding. So um, they were able to replace the chair, which was extremely old, but they didn't have enough money to do the locker room floor. So it wasn't as if they just walked away from the fact that their floor was dangerous. Um, the state made them budget for the improvement for the following fiscal year. So I know, you know, we, we know that ADA is a federal law, but in um, procedure, New York State gets involved and would hold the city to um, making the improvement, even if it didn't have the funds currently to do the improvement. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, I will try to answer that. Um, I'm I not have... asking a question. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to make a statement. Sorry, okay. sorry. Um, that, but, but I'm gonna address it anyway. The difference between the college and the city is that all colleges improvements are financed 50% by the state and 50% by the county. Well, what? They're financed 50% by the state of New York and 50% by the Nassau County. They're not financed by the college themselves. Does that make sense? talking about the improvements, the ADA? Yeah, yeah, any kind of the capital improvements are done, um, are not done. The, the college has no uh, bond issues capacity. All their capital budget comes from these two sources. So okay, that may um, be, but you know, my point is that Long Beach does not act on its own for deciding if they're in violation, they do not act as, a, as the ultimate body. The ultimate body to make the decision is New York State not in just my claim, but other claims, other requests for improvement. So if Long Beach doesn't have the money in the current budget to make a required ADA, um, I don't wanna say improvement, but you know, necessity, um, they have to, they're accountable to New York State to say, yes, we will make the, the um, accommodation within a specific amount of time. That's been my experience. Kathleen, this is Liz. Yeah, hi. 
that governments fall under Title II of the American with Disabilities Act. Right. And it depends on the funding. And as Ina pointed out, the Nassau Community College gets money from the state and from the federal government. So those programs that take that money for that specific issue will have to become compliance. The city of Long Beach, when we started taking FEMA money, and I'm sure you remember how vocal I was that uh, the city wasn't moving uh, as yes. quickly as it should have. And now they are making those, uh, the anywhere the federal money touches is has to become compliance under the ADA guidelines as well as it's not New York State it's the Department of Justice. Oh, okay. All right, but your point is taken, Kathleen. Okay, thank you. Okay, <laughs> bringing it up. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, all right, have a good night. And who's next, Dave? Joseph Naham. Hey, there's somebody we haven't heard from in a while. How you doing there, Mr. Naham? Hi, thanks for wearing your uh, your, your jacket, President Bendo. I like it. <laughs> I, um, I'm doing well, thanks. Hope everyone's well. Um, I'm talking low because my baby's sleeping. Um, but I, I had two questions. Um, okay. One was I had sent in two applications for different Long Beach committee positions uh, three weeks ago and had not received a response. Um, and if possible, um, can I ask for a confirmation that they were received? I've been applying for 10 years to be on the environmental committee. And this also was my first application for the public welfare committee. Um, I hope those uh, committees uh, will, will support um, I know that you had extended positions available, and if they're already full, I hope that you can add additional positions. That's my first um, I will. This is Donna. I will check. If you sent them in three weeks ago, our computers went down two weeks ago, and so they um, we have oh, just yeah. really coming up on Monday, but I will check where your application, where it is, and if I can't find it, we'll get in touch with you. Sounds great. Thanks. I, I that, that slipped my mind about the computers. Oh. Yeah, and one of the things worth noting is at the next council meeting, we'll be voting on a resolution to expand the Environmental Advisory Board and add positions to it. Yeah, I, I had heard that on the last meeting, so I, that, that's what, you know, snapped me up to, to apply. Uh, yeah. The last question, because I don't want to keep you, um, was um, I had asked, this is going down, um, you know, a trip in the past. I had asked um, the previous administration two years ago regarding U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Growing Remediation, um, Public Works Commissioner Miranda, um, and, and some other uh, officials there ensured me that the contractor had completed jobs like this in the past. And I had requested post-operative audits prior to the completion of construction of those um, other projects. Because in their words, these contractors installed groins directly over the tops of the existing 80 plus year old wooden pilings instead of excavating and removing the pilings. And I'm still waiting for those project audits and no one has ever responded from the US Army Corps, um, Sue McCormick's on a different project and um, council members who were on that administration who are still here, still never responded and um, to, to emails in the past. And if, um, if, if the uh, contractors say that they the work was carefully done as per their previous work standards. Let's see how they are today. Um, our groins were already showing signs of compromise and other than I think Paul Gillespie, no one else to my knowledge is concerning, um, you know, uh, and, and asking about uh, just the standards that these other um, projects were done under this contractor. And that's, I think something, to, as I've been saying for a couple of years, look into the the post-operative audits for those other projects. Um, thank you. Okay. Uh, John, I see you're still on. Do you want to, because I know the groins is one of your favorite topics. <laughs> Do you want to you add anything? Uh, well, first of all, the, the DEC actually still has control over this project and they've been doing a three month uh, evaluation on different various parts of the project. And just recently, last month, they were in to do a, uh, a check on the dune and the dune plantings. 
uh, we at the same time had our consultant that we've been using, uh, coastal planning engineers from Florida, uh, come and do a report on the condition of the, of the groins. Uh, well, when they're still not happy with the way they were finished, um, the, the issue really isn't the old wood groins that were there. The issue is the fact that the groins extended 75 feet further than they were, and they were done without any base stone underneath the heavy stones. And that's why you see some of them coming apart at the end. Uh, on a positive side, when our consultant looked at them this year, he felt they were no worse off than, uh, than they were last year. So they seem to have stabilized a little bit, but that doesn't mean we're still happy with them. And, and, uh, and we still have, we continue to put the army Corps on notice about them. But, uh, as soon as I, I had to have a written report from coastal planning engineers that I can share with Mr. Nahum. Okay. Uh, Joey, do you have uh, John Miranda's oh. email? Can you can email him and he'll send it to you? Um, sure. Yeah. I just, but, but to the point of, of post-operative audits on the other projects that they've had, I just feel like it's getting deflected. I, I, I but am I the only person who thinks that that would be, a valuable asset to have to know how they their work done on other projects similar to ours has been like what the statuses of those are. I mean, this, we're we're, we're um. I mean, we're we're, we're, we're unique. We're unique are your beach, and um, it would be helpful, I think, to have as much data as possible on other multi-million dollar projects that that um are basically the, the defense for, for our project. So that's why I, I, I'm, I've been asking for this for two years and, and I feel like it's being deflected. Well, that's nothing that I can get you. Those are projects that are outside of my our jurisdiction. Okay, so I mean, you know, it's private, you know, but, they're, but they're private. So how do I, it, it, does anyone have any advice how I can, I guess I can't foil them because they're private, I don't know. I, I, you could foil the Army Corps and, or maybe you could foil the New York State DEC. That, that's your three minutes, sir. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Okay. So All right. Have a good, happy holidays, everyone. So happy you, holidays. If you email me, I can give you a contact who's taken over for Sue McCormick in the DC on this project, which might be helpful. Okay. Thanks, John. Happy holidays to everyone. All right. Peace. Take care, Joey. You too. All right, Dave, who's next? That's it. That's it. Okay. Well, um, thanks for joining us, folks. Uh, a little bit of a long one tonight. Uh, everybody, please have a very safe, happy, healthy holidays. Oh, Mike's got his lights on. There you go. I had uh, a close with just showing you the, the lights. Okay. And uh, yeah, uh, like I said, everyone have safe, happy, healthy holidays. Uh, Christmas, Hanukkah, Festivus, Kwanzaa, whatever you celebrate. And uh, we'll see you again in 2021. Happy holidays and New Year. Be safe, everyone. Thank you. Everybody, enjoy. Happy Have holidays. Happy New Year. Happy holidays, everyone.